welcome back. I'm glad you all uh, made it through the evening. I know it sounded like everybody had a little diversity in their evening last night. I know we had one concert goer here last night at the Art Center. It sounds like some of you went out to eat and some went to volleyball games or softball games and that. So, but thanks for coming back. One thing I didn't mention yesterday that uh, we will be giving you the phone numbers of all the presenters and of Joel Rosner. Joe Rosner is the one that works with the University of Sioux Falls. So if you have any questions about credits or anything, he is the person to contact. Or if you've taken this class over the course of years and you need to find some history, because we've worked with three different universities. So contact Joe, and of course my phone number will be there as well. So, but time to go ahead and keep moving. Uh, really excited to have Patty Duncan back. Patty used to be right here in Iowa, and she'll explain that, but now she's out in Eugene, Oregon? Salem. Salem, close enough. Close Oregon, enough. Anyway. So, but anyway, let's give Patty a big welcome. Thank you. Can you hear me all right, Jeff? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, it is really good to be here. As um, Bob told you, and I know some of you I recognize, some of you I don't, so... If I lied last time I said my introduction, I'll try not to this time, or I'll try to remember what I said. No, I'm, um, I was born and raised and taught at West Sioux in Hayward in Iowa for a very, very long time. Um, I was 25 years in the classroom there. And um, so I, this is home to me. I, uh, after I left teaching, I taught English and math at West Sioux and other things. Small school, you do what you need to do. And then I went um, into my own business and did my own consulting for a while. And then I, um, in Su then I'm, I did not move to Sioux City, still lived in Haywarden. I uh, was the director of education at Opportunities Unlimited, a residential facility for um, brain injured adults. I loved that job. I loved teaching. Teaching is my first love. I was one of those fortunate, unfortunate, depending on how you look at it, I realized my dream right out of college because I always wanted to go back to West Sioux and teach. Um, but I've had really good jobs, two bad ones I'll tell you about. Um, and then I met my second husband and we moved well, my kids and I moved to Omaha because he doesn't teach, so we moved there. Um, and I did various things. I was the state director of Gifted Ed in Nebraska for a while, um, and I have worked at universities as director of ed, different things, but I've always been involved in education and always in some way taught a class, whether it be the um, dual credit class for community college or online now. I think for me and in my profession it's important for me to keep some contact with the classroom otherwise i'm telling you i would never believe the truth because my frame of reference is not what it is today if that makes sense um, then i spent three long years in kansas running a restaurant with my son three very long years running. <laughs> um, I was just talking about that to someone yesterday and they said, well, how many hours a day did you work? And I said, about 15 for three years, every day. Um, so going on no sleep last night was nothing. I mean, whatever. And then um, we closed the restaurant and my husband was offered a job in Oregon. I have seven children. Um, five of them in the Midwest, two, I'll tell you about my kids in a minute, but two of them were still in school. So we moved to Oregon, it'll be five years in July, and now I have grandchildren, and they're not with me in Oregon. So I don't know how long I'll be in Oregon. It's beautiful, I love it. If, and I am very serious, if you want to come and visit me, I have plenty of room. I'm an hour from the mountains, an hour from the ocean, an hour from the desert. It, it's perfect. It's like vacation every day. It does not rain in Salem every day. 
that's a myth. It does not. Um, during our winter, it might rain in the morning, drizzle, 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 and then rainbow and sun. So it's beautiful. But my family's not there. Um, I have four master's degrees. I graduated from Buena Vista. I have four master's degrees. I'm working on my dissertation um, for my PhD, finally. And, but my greatest, my greatest thing in life is being a mom. I am blessed to be the mother um, in a blended family, truly blended, of seven children. I have two stepchildren who are the oldest. They both live in Nebraska. Um, and I have three. The next three are mine. My daughter is a lobbyist PR person in St. Paul. My son is the manager of Sam's in Des Moines. And my next son is a regional director of Keurig Dr. Pepper, and he lives now back in Kansas City. And then I have Calvin. Um, he graduated high school two years ago, and he is, you know how, when, well, in professional development, you tell stories, and then somehow they come back and bite you? Well, um, as director of Gifted Ed, I would always say, one of the worst things I can say to you is that your child is highly gifted because there's really nothing we can help you with and you're going to struggle. Yeah, God laughed at me and he gave me Calvin. So Calvin is without question my most gifted child and he is also my least accomplished child. We'll be starting our third year in college today, tomorrow. as a freshman because, yeah. And then Ellie is my youngest. She graduated high school last year. And she is my, um, school is hardest for her, but she's a straight A student because she works really, really hard. She was nominated for the gifted program. My son never was. And that's exactly what I preached for years. You know, the gifted kids don't do their work so they can't go to the gifted program and the gifted students are nominated for the gifted program and they can't handle a gifted program. They can barely handle what's going on in class. So anyway, um, that's my story. And I have been working with Bob for a long time. And um, so I am just very happy to be back here. You'll learn more about me because my method of delivery is through stories. And so I, you'll learn way too much about me. But I know you introduced yourselves yesterday, but not to me. And so the one downfall of having four presenters is that you have to do that each time. Uh, maybe not for Lisa yesterday afternoon because she was here in the morning. But anyway, so what I would like to know is your name, where you teach, and then Knowing that I'm going to talk to you about the science of reading and foundational skills, what is it that, that you really are burning to know? What problem do you need me to solve? What information do you need me to give you? And if you say, you know what, Patty, I'm just here because I want to come to Okaboji and sit here for two days, good, good for me. Um, so would you like to start, please? I'm Heidi <coughs> Larson. <coughs> Sorry. I teach third grade at St. Mary's in Stormlight. Um, next year's going to be a little different for me. I'm going to start out as third grade. I was originally going to retire. Well, that didn't work. So, <laughs> But then they don't have enough teachers, so I said I'd stay yep. on to help out. And then second semester, I will um, do math and reading interventions at school. So I guess since I'm going to second semester start working with more than just third grade, I like strategies for different grade levels. Sure. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm Lori McGuire from West Harrison in Mount Lehman. And I taught kindergarten for two years. And this was, <coughs> this last year was my first time in second grade and I moved into first grade. So I'm kind of looking for strategies, good strategies, small group strategies, things like that. Seems like I'm always learning. Me too. Yeah. Thank you. 
Megan Miller. I teach first grade in Esterville. Um, so this is the second year that we're kind of implementing the science of reading. We're in year two of letters training and started a new curriculum, um, CKLA Amplify. So I'm just looking for a bit, little bit deeper understanding of what the science of reading is so I can fully understand it myself in order to implement it better for my students. If you leave me your email, mm -hmm. I'll email you some things. Okay. Um, because I'm not going to get into it really deeply. I'm going to do the, um, I'm too busy to learn what it's really about overview kind of so that you have the facts. Mm -hmm. So, but if you, I have lots of information on it. So I'd be happy to email you and you okay. can read out your. Okay, thank you. Okay, sure. Hi, Shelly Vandenberg. I teach third grade. Um, and the last year or so, our school has really changed. We've just had a lot of minority move-ins. And so I'm having to teach reading in a completely different way because mm -hmm. my kids are illiterate when they come to me. So just looking for some ideas. OK, thank you. I'm Jenny Putt. Can I teach at fifth grade at Boyer Valley uh, in Dunlap, Iowa? <laughs> and um, we are starting our first year of letters training this year, so I just wanted to get some information, sort of like prep us for what's to come, because sure. I'm understanding that letters training is very in depth. It is. So. It is. Good program, but it, it is. Thank you. Julie Malone. I also teach fifth grade at Boyer Valley. Um, and the same thing, just beginning letters training, wanting some depth of information or more information to what it, what is to come. And I think kids are constantly changing. Mm -hmm. I just always need new ideas and fresh thoughts before my new class comes in. Thank you. Um, I know that lots of people will say, oh, kids are no different than they were. Well, um, as we were trying to get this PowerPoint on the screen for you to see, I was thinking, and we were talking a little bit about the old transparency days, you know, this would have never happened unless the light bulb, and you always had another light bulb because the principal kept one in his, his closet just for, because someone would take him out of the supply room, yeah. Um, but I said, well, I could still hold the transparency up to the light and we could, you know, we'd work it out. If my grandson, who's four, had been here, he probably could have figured out what was wrong. Kids, and in my classroom, when I was teaching, if the film projector didn't work, they'd say, oh, free day today. I mean, they didn't know how to do that kind of thing. And now, I, th I really think kids are changing and the things that they're exposed to that sometimes I haven't even been exposed to in my life yet. It, to me, it's scary. Very, very scary. The field of education is changing. Um, I, I'm doing contract work for several companies right now, and I attended a professional development last week, and they put up the statistics. Nine out of 10 teachers um, report significant burnout. 55% of the teachers that start school this, this fall will leave by the end of the year. And here we have one, pr maybe, you know. Well, next year will be my 40th year. So I've been at it a while. I just, <clears throat> the reason I just needed, it was, it's too much in the classroom anymore. At oh. Age. When you get in your 60s, it's like, oh my gosh, I was I, tired. But <laughs> I, uh, I don't know that I, I mean, I can go in and out as a coach. Mm -hmm. I can do that. I don't know that I could go every day. I was talking to a lady at the pool yesterday who's also a teacher, but she heard me talking on the phone about professional development, so we started a conversation. And she was telling me in Minnesota, where my daughter works, so now I'm going to have to ask her about this, but Minnesota is adopting a required, uh, yeah, I guess, a required list of reading programs, and you can only use from that required list. And I, I see that coming in most places now. But um, 
they're supposed to start in the fall. This is mid-June, late June. They have no idea what programs are even on the list yet. Anyway, we were talking about discipline, and she said she, she needs to leave teaching because she just can't do it. And she's um, not quite as old as me, but probably your age. And she, um, I said, I remember the day mid-teaching career when I had a young man in my classroom, senior in high school, not, not elementary, and he was eating sunflower seeds and he spit all the seeds on the floor. And so after class I said to him, you need to, you need to go get a broom and sweep those up. And he said, not my job, it's the janitor's job. Ha ha ha, no. You'll spend a week cleaning with the janitor after school. Well, the principal came in and he said to me, Patty, I don't think you can do that anymore. And I said, want to bet? So I called his mom. And she said, oh no, he's not doing it for a week. He's doing it for two weeks. And that's the way it was when I was teaching. And now, yeah, that. So, um, so I think kids are changing. And I see that in my grandchildren. I taught the novel 1984. We're way beyond 1984. Things are scary, very scary. Um, along with that, then, so too does education have to change. And as we know, education is probably the last thing to change. And I'm going to, a lot of what I tell you, but I will tell you, is based on research, but it's also my opinion. We're doing another pendulum swing. And since the beginning of reading, we have done this pendulum thing. We call it different things. We call it um, whole word, whole language, you know, and then we go back to phonics, and then we do this. However, the science of reading is not just a return to phonics. And I know that sometimes that's what we say. But I do want to tell you, I feel like the Lucy Calkins of professional development right now because how many years did I present the foundations of reading to you? You know, and I gave you some of the strategies that now they're saying if you use them, you're murdering the chances of children ever reading or something, I don't know. So, um, but I do think someone who has more influence than I do should say, why don't we embrace it and do some of each? So a lot of the things I share with you today are how to incorporate both um, what you have been doing, what you already know, and what you're going to be expected to do. So let's get started. What do you, I was going to do, um, have you used menti.com where you do a word cloud online? I was going to do that, but with problems we've had with technology, I'm not going to. So just imagine it in your head doing a word cloud. When, I th um, when, when, you, th when you hear the science of reading, tell me what you think of. Take one minute, jot three things down, and then I'll have you share. Let's just go around and just say your three things. And we'll start over here this time because you got up and so. Um, I put down, it's the study of reading and what it is and how it works. What it is, how it works, and study good. Thank you. I put, you know, I think of the science just like the mechanics and the phonics. The foundations. The instructions, mm -hmm. yeah, foundation. Okay, thank you. I put dissecting reading into smaller parts, looking at the how of reading and going back to the foundation. Okay, perfect. I put how like the sounds are formed in our mouths and why students struggle with those. Thank you. I put fluency, recognition, word recognition, comprehension. Thank you. I said phonetic approach, study, and breaking apart. Okay. Thank you. This isn't in the PowerPoint, but listening to your answers, um, I'd like you to do the same thing with guided reading. What do you think of when you hear guided reading? Okay, again, this doesn't have to be a dissertation or anything, and we're going to start right here and go around this way. Okay. So I put um, that it's the leveling of students, and it really helps you focus on what each individual student needs because it's small groups. 
Mm -hmm. Thank you. I put <clears throat> small group, repeat practice, level two ability. Thank you. I put structure, small group, systematic approach. Thank you. Directing students into a path to practice reading skills in small groups. Thank you. I just have small group skill work conversations about stories. Thank you. And I put small groups at the students' levels and sharing books together. Okay, thank you. Interesting. Um, okay, I've never done this presentation for real people before, so, I mean, just for my family. Um, so I'm modifying as we go, because I want you to get the most out of it. What I would like you to do now is at your tables, I'd like you to take maybe two minutes. Again, not a long time, just the top of your head thought, not deep thought. Why are we abandoning guided reading and going to the science of reading? What happened that we don't think guided reading is working anymore? Or did it ever? Or does it still? Just discuss that at your table. Choose one person to report back. Okay, let's come back together. Um, good discussions going on at your table. I will be interested. Did you all choose a person? Okay. <laughs> With this table followed directions. They chose. Um, so we'll let them go first. You can work it out. So for us, two of us are away from guided reading now. One school still does it. But um, we just said, like, the biggest thing for guided reading is, yes, it narrows down on what exactly they need. But you kind of have to piecemeal because there's really not a complete writing program. Yes, there's writing within the reading, but it doesn't have the writing. It doesn't have its own individual phonics. And, like, at least with our school, when COVID hit, we needed something to bring that all together to help those skills. So we went away from guided reading to have a more cohesive pro program that had it all in there because K2 had one thing for phonics, 3-4 had another, 5-8 had their own. And I missed the guided reading part though, you know, because that was great to see exactly what the kids know where not all reading programs have that opportunity to do the small group time. And that's very beneficial for those kids. And that's one thing we talked about how so many things are done whole class. And it's not necessarily conducive to all kids. And it's too high, it's too low, you're bored, you know, kids are left in the dark. Um, may I ask what guided reading program you used? We just did our own. Did your own, okay. We that used Reading Wonders. Re wonders, yeah. okay. We did a lot of Pioneer Valley books, but um, we just had a book room and they were okay. leveled and we just went and grabbed the books that okay. we needed based on what the kids need. Okay. Okay. Next steps. Thank you. Maybe? Next steps. Next yeah. steps. Yes. We, we use wonders, but by third quarter, I go to the, our book room and sure. pull out books because the level readers at that point, I want the kids in chapter books and immersed in the literature. Um, I am not a big conspiracy person. I, I think things happen because they happen. But, um, and I work for some pretty big publishing companies. Part of me wonders how much of this is driven by publishing companies. Just a thought. Okay. Do you believe in the guided reading? Is that what you're saying? I believe in parts of the guided reading, absolutely. And for some of the reasons that this table said, problems? Oh yeah. So I'm probably the only um, high school teacher at the time that taught for 25 years and never bought a textbook, which is also why someday I'll end up in copyright jail, um, because <laughs> I could never find a textbook that did what I wanted it to do. So I would get sample copies of the textbooks and of novels and I made up my own because that's what my kids needed. And my principal would say, Patty, you have five classes of English. Can't they all do the same thing? No, they can't because they can't. I had a, one, one year I had a, a classroom and I had 16 boys in it. You think I'm gonna use the same reading material that I use for, no. 
I no, because my goal was to get them to read. So anyway, um, he he stayed with me, uh, and I owe a lot of that to Joe Rosner, because Joe supported me. He would always say, "Patty knows what she's doing." I don't know if he really believed that or not, but anyway, he supported me in it. So okay, this group share what share. Not that we had an answer as to why guided reading is kind of going away, but we talked about how it's a little bit tough to manage. So mm -hmm. yes, you have this group, but then what is everyone else doing? So maybe that's part of the reason. Um, also, the population of kids is changing, mm -hmm. so maybe they need more of the basics, the science of reading. So those were some thoughts that we had um, as to why it maybe is going away, but we all think that there are parts of it that we do. Yeah, thank you. Um, I did a lot of guided reading implementation. And when we did this, and I would say to the teachers, okay, what do you need from me? The only thing they needed from me in guided reading, classroom management. That's the only thing. I mean, they knew how to do everything else. They knew how to do small groups. They knew how to do center, you know, the rotation. They knew that. But what do I, how do I get that group of word work kids to be doing what they're supposed to be doing when I'm working with these kids in small, how do I do that? When I have 25 kids in my room, five groups going on, how do I do that? Yeah, so I, I get that. that and now, um, Anyone that wants to go to Las Vegas and teach, they're paying big, 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 big money because they have the bottom of the, although in Oregon we're pretty close to the bottom of the bottom. Um, but they're not bad teachers in Las Vegas, not at all. But when, I don't know of any teacher that I have ever met, and I know some really good teachers that could handle 40 kids elementary in a classroom by themselves. I don't know. It's impossible. Impossible. Okay. Um, I hope that I don't expect you nor encourage you to agree with everything I say today, but I do want you to think about it. Okay, so stay open-minded because we're going to address some of the things that you talked about. Albert Einstein, one of my favorites, because I have a math major, and also because he was, he had the same kind of brain I did. Um, he really was a right-sided brain thinker, but he had left brain gifts, and so he was able to put them all together. Um, I don't know that I've done that yet, but the more I know, the more I realize I don't know. And that's how I really feel. The more I learn from you, the more I read, the more I don't know. In fact, um, on Facebook I'm um, connected to some of my former students and there are many times I just want to say, I am so sorry. I don't know what I was thinking when I did that with you. You know, I, I don't know. I made you memorize parts of Shakespeare. What was I thinking? Who cares who said what? Who cares? But um, I sure did <laughs> for a long time. Ten quotations from Macbeth. Who said this? To whom did they say it? And what did it mean? Unbelievable. Okay, we talked about science. Here is the definition of science. It's a noun. The intellectual and practical activity encompassing the systemic study of the structure and behavior of the physical and natural world through observation and experiment. And a Systemically organized body of knowledge. The fact is that what's behind the science of reading is to give you an organized system of teaching. And they are you, they, whoever they is, um, when I die I'm going to meet this they that we speak of always, but... Um, <laughs> They are using brain studies. So um, when, when you dive deep into the science of reading, they have brain scans 
of children who are fluent in reading, children who are not, children who can't decode, children who can, and they look at the scans of what areas of the brain and then how we can best activate those areas and um, things like that. So that's where the science comes from. And then this definition. So the science of reading basically gives, gives us a system for teaching reading with some very explicit yeses and nos. So what is the science of reading? The science of reading has actually been going on for a long time. That's why we um, the National Reading Panel did its study. That's why we have Common Core. Um, you know, all of those things come from the same studies that the science of reading comes from. And that is basically, how do people learn to read? From my experience, people learn to read differently. I'll use myself as an example because I know myself the best, but um, I went to school, I started school in country school. I learned to read, however, at home. I learned to read because my grandpa, my mom, my grandma, and even my dad read to me. And they did the put their finger under the word as they read. And I sat in their lap, I had eyes on text the whole time. Did I memorize before I read? Probably. But that's how I learned to read. Country school, 14 kids, two in kindergarten, and then all the way to eighth grade. I'm not a, I'm not a very artistic person, and I don't really like games all that much. So when I wasn't being taught in small groups, because that's what you do in country school, small groups, I joined the other groups. So second grade reading was my favorite in kindergarten because they had really cool stories. And so my teacher let me sit in with the second graders rather than go to the closet and get a coloring book. I got to first grade, I had to go to town school to close the country school. We had phonics, phonics workbooks with the deer. I remember that, it was green, it was really pretty. I like school, school is, school is like a drug for me. I like learning. So I, I did phonics, I learned phonics, the schwa sound, the whole thing. I loved it, but I didn't learn to read that way. I have a son who went through school for whole word. During the time when spelling doesn't matter, just spell it how it sounds. We'll figure it out. Spelling doesn't matter. And I'm speaking in, I'm speaking in ex kind of exaggerations, but. So he is, um, he probably makes the most money of all my kids, manager at Sam's. I shouldn't say that because then you'll boycott how much money is spent there, but he makes, he makes really good money. Um, he still can't spell. And his compensation for not being able to spell, well now it's the computer, but then it was handwriting. So if he didn't know if it was an E or an I in a word, he would just kind of mix those two together when he wrote. And then if the teacher would say, how do, you, how do you spell that? And he's a very personable person. He would say, how do you think I spelled it? Yeah, because he learned that at home. Um, anyway, maybe somewhere in the middle we would find our answer. Just a thought. The science of reading has revealed several key findings, including why students may not learn to read and the kind of instruction that most effectively gets them on the path to literacy. The children that we're studying are children that don't come to school reading. And if you've taken any of my classes, you probably remember 
it's very important for children from a very early age to to hear as many words as they can hear, to read as many words as they, they can, to, to language is very important. So I'm, I, one of the bad things that earning my doctorate has done for me is that I have seen how research can be manipulated to what the person is using it for. And that, that worries me a little. So, do your own research. Most students can learn to read. There are a very, very few who can't, but that's very few. About 20% of elementary school students have serious problems learning to read, and at least another 20% are at risk of not meeting grade level expectations. Still, I mean, that's scary. I, um, I should remember this statistic, but it's over 50% of the children that we have in school right now are not at grade level in reading. Um, that's scary, but we can teach those kids. We can teach the, the at-risk kids. We can teach the ones who have learning problems. We can handle that. That's what you learn when you come to, to classes. Teachers are very, very good at learning how to do that. Um, because it's 5% of the kids can't read. We can't teach them how. Okay, that's 5%. So, high quality evidence-based instruction can greatly impact these kids' trajectories. You, pr you may have heard the story um, that, that I have told why I know how to teach reading being a high school English teacher and that is that I had a senior in high school that I discovered through not a very good experience for either of us um, that he couldn't read and so I had to learn how to teach reading and again thank goodness for Joe because he put me in these kinds of classes for elementary reading and I, I learned a lot about how to teach high school kids. And um, I taught him to read and he went on to be very successful and he still talks about that to me. His, the principal, his mom and dad, and me. The only people that knew he couldn't read. That was our deal. He got in trouble in my class every day so he could stay after school and I could teach him how to do it. But anyway, um, your job as teachers of reading, in my opinion, is probably the most important job in the world. Because without reading, the kids can't do social studies, they can't do science, they can't do math. You might think they could do math, but they can't because story problems are such a big deal. So they can't. Unless you teach them how to read, I challenge each of you to put yourself in a situation that you can't read because we don't remember what it's like not to be able to read. But you can put yourself in a situation where you can't read. Pick up a book in a foreign language that you don't know. And then have someone ask you questions about it. Pick up, for me, it's anything mechanically related. Pick up a, this is the experiment that I like to do. Pick up a Minecraft, you know that game Minecraft. Pick up one of those manuals and read a paragraph and see then if you can explain it to me. Put yourself in a position where you can understand the vocabulary and see what it does to you physically. Because I, I'm telling you, that's how, how the children feel if they don't know how to read. That's how they feel in math, science, social studies, not just in reading. And so I also challenge te teachers who don't teach reading to become teachers of reading. Okay, the science of reading is sometimes called structured literacy by some of the publishing companies. In order to qualify for a program to be called structured literacy, <coughs> 
Um, it needs to teach all of the components that are found to be the most important in teaching reading. And it has to employ the principles that align with each of those components. What we are seeing nationally is that this is determined at the state level. So again, I encourage you and I'm happy to share with you if you um, send me an email, I'm happy to share with you everything that, that I have on this, but I encourage you to feel comfortable and arm yourself with the knowledge to make these decisions yourself. Because in my opinion, this is regional, it's also individual, and no one knows your students like you do. And I would challenge, and I, I know some excellent reading programs out there. I would challenge any reading program to qualify for that. Again, many of your colleagues are not going to be as prepared for teaching as you are. And so they're going to depend on a textbook and that worries me. I'll give you an example. My daughter that I shared with you who struggles in school, very, no, she doesn't struggle in school. She's very good at school. It's just she spends a lot of time getting good grades. At one time in her senior year, <coughs> well, throughout her life, but in her, she wanted to be a teacher. But because she works so hard in school, I mean, she'll spend hours and hours a day on homework. Um, she was tired of going to school. She did go to community college. She took last term off because she needed a break. But anyway, she wanted to be a teacher, and she'd be an excellent teacher. Um, so she works at Target, likes it, um, is thinking about esthetician school, but she still has that teaching bug. You know how it is, never goes away. Uh, so she came home hmm, about three weeks ago, said to me, Mom, I don't think I'll start esthetician school yet. And I said, okay, what are you going to do? Because you can't just sit home. That's not an option. And you're part-time at Target, you have part-time, you took a term off, that's okay. But, And she said, well, I'm going to be a substitute teacher and see if I like it. And so... Again, my frame of reference, I said to her, honey, that's, that's a really good idea, but you have to go to school for that. She said, no, you don't. Yeah, pretty sure you do. Honey, pretty sure you do. No, mom, you don't. Um, lots of people at Target do it. You just call this number and they ask you some questions and then your name goes in a computer and then you look on the list and if you want to work that day you see where you could work and if you see something you want you just type your name in and then you go to that school. <laughs> I started laughing and I said, no honey, that's not how it works. Yeah, mom, it is. No, it's not. You know what? It is. That's exactly how it works. So I'm very upset by this, as you can well imagine. And so I, um, I work for VOOX still, for those of you that, that may remember that. And I had a, an educational board meeting the next day, actually. And so I have two teachers on the board. And I said, let me tell you what's happening in Salem, Oregon. Because I went on the website, and that's really how it works. Oh, one of the teacher from Texas said, I can top that. Our best substitute last year was a senior in high school. Okay, I, I, I can't even really get started on that. Um, bless their hearts. I mean, bless their hearts for that. But I'm telling you, um, my daughter said to me, Mom, I'll just use all your stuff. And I said, well, honey, but you don't know how to use it. And she said, that's okay. She said, it's just like babysitting. Mm -hmm. No, it's not, but okay. Okay. 
So they'll be depending on the textbook was my connection there. Okay, so here are the five components that are essential to reading. Do they look familiar to you? Absolutely they do. These, um, you will see some publishing companies call them the foundational skills of reading. You'll see some publishing call them the five pillars of reading, um, the five components essential to reading now. This is what you know. You know phonemic awareness, you know phonics, you know fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension. We have done the hierarchy. We, we know that phonemic awareness comes first, and that is the individual sounds of letters. Then phonics, where you put the sounds of letters to make words. And then fluency, where you um, read with expression and you read, you don't have to decode anymore. You, uh, and vocabulary where you have the three tiers and comprehension when you put it all together. Again, if you want to go into that into more depth, there is a one hour class at Sioux Falls University this fall online. I'm teaching it. Same kind of thing that, that I've done here before. But Do you have any questions? Okay, if you want more information on that, um, we can certainly dive into that too. Can you say the three tiers of vocabulary? Yeah, do you want to talk about those a minute? Sure, I absolutely I can. Um, and again, anything that you want more information on that I say, write it down and ask me and I, I am happy to give it to you. Okay, three tiers, tier one, tier two, tier three. Tier one are the words that you should know. They're sight words. He, she, it. Everyone should know tier one words. Shouldn't have to teach them. You should know them. That's a problem because not everyone does. Tier two are the wor where you want to concentrate. They're the new vocabulary. They're the vocabulary words you teach so that the children can understand the text that you're reading. Tier three words are jargon, content specific. So is there a real need for the whole world to know what um, phoneme means? It, is there? Or do we only have to know it if we're going to teach them? You know, um, most of our time in teaching is spent in Tier 2, where we teach Tier 2 words. They're vocabulary words that are common. They're found on the state tests. Um, They'll be used again in life, but they're introduced through reading. Does that help at all? Thank okay. You. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, how do we put structured literacy into practice? There are four principles that will guide structured reading or science of reading. Remember they're interchangeable depending on who you're reading. Okay, this is the big change. Instruction has to be explicit. That means high school teachers are reveling if they kept their old um, yellow pads of college notes because that's how high school teachers used to teach. We just got out our college notes and we read them off and we thought the kids would love literature. I walked into the classroom my first day thinking that knowing 20 interpretations of Beowulf would make my children, my students, love Beowulf. You know what? Didn't. They could really care less. In fact, the best interpretation of Beowulf came from one of my lower students. So this is, this is the big thing. This is what we call whole group 
I mean, in guided reading, we call it whole group, when you explicitly teach. So you stand in front of your kids, they get all the information. We're going to need different skills because when you have, well, I'm going to use the number 25 and that's probably too low, but when we have 25 children in our classroom, we have 25 different things. So I'm going to dig out my old learning styles PowerPoint because we're going to have to use that again because we're going to have to accommodate all those children. Has to be cumulative. <sighs> that means we're going to go back into the blame game. They should have learned this in kindergarten. I shouldn't have to be teaching this. Principal's going to come in and say, Johnny doesn't know the letter, his letters. I know, we worked on it all year. He doesn't. Because you can't, in structured literacy, you can't go on until you know. Okay. It's systemic, systematic, means logically skilled order. So we go from simple to complex. Um, I'm going to use a math example here just to get you thinking. We are the only country in the world who teaches math the way we do. Um, and because I was lucky enough to, be, to teach math as well, I taught algebra backwards. So I taught the last of the chapter before the beginning. I had real good luck with that. I, I used a textbook for math, but I had a lot of luck with that. Because if the kids knew what they were going to do, they wanted to know how to do it. So, um, and I didn't make that, that up. That's how other countries do it. So, I'm just wondering. So when I tell you how to, when I give you an example of how to do this, I may not follow all these rules exactly. But again, you don't have to agree with me. In fact, I'm fine if you say, yeah, I didn't learn anything, but I sure learned not a lot, or whatever that would be. And it's diagnostic and responsive. In other words, um, progress is monitored and instruction is modified. Good luck. That's a, a good luck. I mean, we do that. We do that. So what I'm presenting to you now is what the research says. But you have to know, and this is why I get along so well with Bob and Joe, good for them. They're not in the classroom every day. You know? I want to make it real f as real for you as I, as I can. Questions? Comments? Okay. Oh, let's see, I have some notes here. What did I want to make sure? Oh. <clears throat> I want to make sure I talk to you a little bit about decoding. Put your awareness glasses on and listen to some of your poor readers talk. Many times the whole in older kids stems back from phonemic awareness. I'll give you a personal example, although it, it's meaningless, it doesn't really affect anybody. Um, until probably three years ago, I thought the gas pedal on the car was called a foot feet, because that's what I heard. It's called a foot feed. Um, I only know that because I saw it in print. And I thought, oh, they didn't have a very good proofreader. Never did understand why it was called a foot feet. 
But then my logic kicked in and I thought, it makes sense that it's called a foot feed because you're feeding the car gas with the foot feed. Never made sense foot feet, but that's what I heard. So that's what I thought. When kids hear and think a word is different than it really is, that messes them up. Listen to how many times I'm teaching a, an online um, English class now to um, adults that are in their third year of college. They just did their final papers, so I was up a lot of the night grading final papers. And I should have saved some of these examples, but I could tell, and some of them are second la English as a second language, some of them are military, some of, I mean, so they're national. Um, I could tell that that's what they thought the word was. It wasn't, it was misspelled, but not misspelled because they misspelled it, it's because they misheard it. Does that make sense to you? So, so in comprehension, one of the um, interesting things for me in working with older students is to go back and find their hole in phonemic awareness. What's scary to me about that is that with the pandemic, we're, going, we're grades behind. After second grade, generally teachers aren't focused on the teaching of reading, but rather how reading is used to learn, not how to learn to read. So we don't hone those skills. We're going to have next year, nationally, fifth graders at a first grade level. Those fifth grade teachers are going to have to know a lot about phonemic, a lot about the foundational skills. And we, we, and I say that collectively as educators, have not prepared our teachers for that. I mean, how many middle school teachers do you know that could name the five foundations of reading? Let alone help children fill those holes if they have them. Okay. Okay, so that leads me to my next, this slide. Decoding times language comprehension will equal reading comprehension. I can't, I can't imagine English being a second language for someone with all of the nuances we have in our language. And then I, I put some definitions as it is used in the science of reading. Decoding is the reader's linkage of printed words on the page to their spoken equivalents. And language comprehension is the reader's ability to construct meaning from the spoken language. The information, questions that you might have, things you might want more information on or want to discuss a little bit more. Where are you in your thinking? Any volunteers? I don't really have a question so far as I'm just... That's okay. It's, it's kind of, you know, you're just chatting men and all. Just education in general, it scares me. I have grandkids and I just think my oldest is a second grader. I'm going to be a third grader. It worries me what's going to happen. As I shared with you, that's why I'm back in consulting. Because I want, I want to do, I want, I want to do as much for you as I can. But more importantly, I want you to know that you are supported. And so, um, I'm not working for one publishing company and I am not doing program activation. So I'm not going to come in and teach you how to use letters. I'm going to come in afterwards and say, how do I really use 
this program? How can I, um, how can I manage my small groups? How can I use small groups? How can I do, how can I do this when I have six different levels of kids in my classroom? That's what I'm doing because that's what you need. And I voice this very loudly and clearly. Give teachers a textbook and the information that they need, they can figure it out. That isn't what they need me for. They need me to come in and give them ideas on what to do when they're in the classroom. They don't, anyway. I, I too, I have, and I don't say this publicly because um, my brother-in-law, whom I taught, is president of the school board at West Sioux, and I was just at my nephew's graduation. Oh, my great nephew. Um, I feel old today. Um, and um, he said to me, Patty, I'm going to ask you something. Please don't answer. Will you come back and teach for us? And I said, <laughs> what? And he said, we don't have teachers like you anymore. He said, you made me write a 25-page term paper, and I loved it. Yeah. He said, I still talk about it. Yeah. And he said, would you please come back and do that? I'll give you all the support you want. Probably not. But I'll think about it. So I went home, and I said, how would everyone feel about moving back to Hayward? <laughs> no, not really, Mom. OK. Whatever. Um, anyway, I took that as a real compliment from a student and a relative and the president of the school board. Don't, don't be silent. We, have, we are the change that we need to make. We have the knowledge. We can do it, but we can't do it alone. So develop friends develop and fight we there's no one better to educate our kids than the teachers that are in the classroom okay and I'll do what I can to support you and I mean that seriously I used to call principals and do teachers fights for them that was my favorite um, okay I t it is um, that's where the math side of my brain comes in because I can be very logical. Um, okay, this is the ladder of reading. You've probably seen this. If you haven't and you're being trained in the science of reading, you will see it. Um, this, so 5% of the kids, they learn to read. Anybody could have taught them to read. They just have a natural gift. 35% learn to read relatively easily. 40 to 50% of the children or of people who learn to read require code-based, explicit, systematic, and sequential instruction. And 10 to 15% generally those kids with learning difficulties such as dyslexia, and this is put out by um, the IDA, I think. Um, they need, they require code-based, explicit, systematic, sequential diagnostic instruction over and over and over again. The structured literacy approach works with everyone. So, so you see where they're rationalizing and supporting the teaching of structu structured literacy because it hits all the groups. The top two groups, they'd actually be okay anyway. But the research is telling, telling us that about 65% of our kids need structured literacy approach. My personal comment to this is, what do you think we've been doing? 
Small, small groups doesn't mean that kids sit at tables and the teacher has coffee and donuts at the desk. I mean, that isn't what it means. Okay. But I wanted you to see that. I want you to see what's out there. Okay, so, will guided reading work with the science of reading? You're going to hear people say, no, it won't. I want, I want to challenge you to think about it a little bit differently because you are the expert in the field. If anyone wants my PowerPoint, I'll send it to them. I don't, I don't care. Okay, so, and you came up with this list very similar when we did our first questions. In traditional guided reading, students are grouped by reading level. In the science of reading, they're grouped by skill. Traditional guided reading, we use level books. Science of reading, they're decodable books. Traditional guided reading, books contain words with a, vari a wide variety of spelling patterns. Science of reading, Books are controlled and only contain words with taught spelling patterns. In guided reading, guessing strategies are prioritized. And this again is where I feel I have done people in this room a disservice because I have, and I've written countless activities. Look at the picture. Tell me the story that the picture tells you. Can you read it now? Yeah. Um, in the science of reading, decoding strategies are prioritized. In traditional guided reading, phonics lesson is taught, but it comes second to the reading lesson. These skills most likely won't be seen in the leveled book. In the science of reading, phonics lesson is taught before reading, the decodable book contains the phonics skill and allows students to practice it in context. Okay. I want you to take a good five minutes and discuss this chart in your groups. What do you think about it? What does this say to you? Do you believe it? Is there a way to do both? Is one better than the other? Use specific examples from your class of students. Talk about it. Okay, so will you go first this yes. time, please? Thank you. Um, we talked a lot back and forth, pros and cons of each. Um, we talked about how the science of reading doesn't level kids, so that might be a big advantage. Also, to do the phonics lesson in context, also a big advantage. And then we spent a lot of time on, yes, but if we only do that, are kids going to not like reading as much? Um, and they had some experience with going from novel study, novel groups, to a basal, and how that changed. I can tell you just from experience which one is going to be more fun or more engaging for students. Um, so that's kind of, we went back and forth, pros and cons of both. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. This group. It's basically the same type of conversation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we talked about how guided reading worked and how we're trying to fit that in more so with Amplify and CKLA mm -hmm. to see how we can group them, not by reading level, but more by their skill mm -hmm. to pull in some of those small groups that we don't get to do. I think you can't throw out everything on this side to go, I mean, there's got to be a happy medium. <clears throat> I think that, and maybe that's why I feel so comfortable doing this conference, because maybe we in, in the Midwest are more like that? I don't know. 
Um, I wor personally worry when states are going to dictate to me what I can use in my classroom. I'm, I worry about that. And I don't care who's in charge. Maybe that's because I don't like to be told what to do. I don't know. I mean, maybe it's a personality flaw I have. But if you're hiring me to teach, trust me that I know how to do it. On the other hand, if my daughter's going into a classroom at 19 years old with no background, somebody better tell her what to do. Okay. Um, I want to share an experience with you that I had. I was um, coaching in Sacramento in the San Juan School District. I loved it there. I was there um, a week, a month, and for four years. So I developed a real rapport, kindergarten, preschool, kindergarten, first and second grade, a real rapport with those teachers. And we didn't talk about the science of reading because it was I haven't been there for three years. So, it, you know, it was a while ago. But we knew this. They were using guided reading, liked it, but holes. So we brainstormed and we developed our own program, called it Target Time. And three times, two times a week, we had Target Time. And target time is where we looked at all the kids and we put them with teachers for nine weeks. So all the teachers participated, oh, every actually everyone, because we had lunch people, we had janitors, we, uh, or cause what, whatever they're called, maintenance people, whatever. The principal, the PE teacher, the music, I mean, we all did it. We took an area that we felt comfortable with of the five foundational skills. They had a teacher's meeting once a week and planned this. Children were assessed, diagnosed, discussed, and put into groups by skill, not by grade level, by skill. And then they went to that classroom for half hour, twice a week, three times a week, and focused on that skill. The most successful thing we did. Everything else remained the same. We did guided reading just like the textbook said. We did everything. But for that time, they focused on that skill. Sometimes the teacher would assess before the end of the six weeks and move them. We assessed every six weeks and moved the children, or not. I mean, sometimes they weren't ready. Extremely successful. But it was developed by the teachers. We ju I, let, I facilitated, I didn't make the program up. We just found where our holes were, we, what can we do about it? Well, I really like fluency. I, uh, one of the teachers loved Reader's Theater, loved it. So she did that part of the fluency. What grade levels? Pre-K, kindergarten, first, and second. And we all did it together. So we had some pre-K in with second graders. But they, they knew, I mean, it, they didn't care. Because this was, we presented it like it was kind of a fun time. You know, we're going to, and we did fun things. I mean, they did hard work. But we presented it as a kind of break from your teacher, break from the regular day. Um, I just talked to the principal there. They still do that. And she said it is even more successful because the teachers are getting much better at it. You know, and now they have three, well, they have six years worth of materials to choose from. And they have a big, this I fought really hard for. We have one classroom where we have resources. So all their leveled books are there, all their decodable books, and I made them do lesson plans. Well, but this is my lesson. No, this is not your lesson plan. Think of how great it would be to see someone else use what you developed. 
That's what I would tell them. And so they put all their lesson plans in there, so they share. So re it really is a good program. <coughs> Did you guys speak? No. I'm no. Okay. We're implementing wind time in our our building this year, also. So wait time. Wind. 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 Well, oh, wind. I thought you said wait time, and I was going to say, is are you telling me I don't do that? So it it's kind of the same thing, yeah. However, we are grade blocking it like K one, two, three, four, five. Just because we don't we didn't feel with. comfortable, <laughs> yeah, to start with. We didn't know how a fifth grader would feel about going down to like a first grade classroom. Yeah, you have to remember in Sacramento. In California, the school buildings are different, so the hallways are really the outside sidewalk, and so they're set up differently. So those children are together a lot, and so it wasn't it wasn't as socially challenging as it would be in our class. Yeah, so that's that's great. Did you share with? You were, okay, so we're all good now? All right. Okay, so how can you make the change? How can you compromise? These are some ideas. Again, not follow the recipe exactly, but just kind of get an idea. It's not a stop sign. It's not something you have to absolutely do. It's more of a suggestion. Swap your level text for decodable text. That's one of the ways you can accomplish using guided reading philosophy in a science of reading classroom. The benefits of using decodable books in small groups include they're designed to add the phonics skills sequentially. Increase the skills as you go on. I haven't had time yet to look at some of the books that I was taught, you know, like the Dick and Jane series, but I think, I'm pretty sure they're, they would be considered decodable. Students will get, but again, that whole series ran through how many grades? Well, none of you know. I had, I had the spot in Dick and Jane. And Puff. And Sally, yep. but they were introduced in in grades, you know. So Dick and Jane came first, and the bicycles, and then then Spot and Puff, and then Sally, and and oh, I loved that series. Anyway, um, skills will get explicit practice on the phonics skills you're trying to target. So you're going to uh, decodable books will help you do that because you can say, all right. Dick and Jane. Short I. I mean, you, you know, I don't have to explain that. Most words are decodable to students, which means they can actually read them. Talk about, yeah, so they'll, they'll have confidence. Make sure that you are choosing the right decodable books. That's going to take some time to be able to put that together. So if you choose decodable books that don't match up to your teaching scope and sequence and that includes kind of and include phonics skills you haven't taught, then they're not considered decodable. So again, my conspiracy theory, where are you going to get those decodable books quick and dirty? There's something to be said about authentic literature. I mean there there really is. So I I don't know. I would love to just be in your classroom and help you coach and help coach you through that. But I don't know the answer. Okay, second point. Change your teaching point. Instead of making your teaching point for each lesson a guessing strategy like I have said in this room, check the picture. Swap it for a teaching point or strategy that helps students actually read the words. So a phonics skill. T 
Today we will work with CVC words that contain short vowel A. Okay, I'm going to do a little activity with you. Write a three word sentence where each word has a short vowel A. Okay, anybody ready? We're going to do popcorn. <laughs> so when you have the answer, just pop it out. Or have an answer, there is no the answer. Pat can bat. Pat can bat. Anyone? Fat cat sat. <laughs> cat what? Fat cat sat. Fat cat sat. Matt ran fast. Matt ran fast. I sat on the black mat. Three words. Oh, the three words. <laughs> 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 okay, okay. I want to use this as a teachable moment. <laughs> teachable moment. Do you see what I just did to her? How would she feel if she were a first grader? And I had given the example, I had given explicit instructions, a three word sentence. She did that, she's obviously my overachiever and now I've said, yeah, that's not right. <laughs> that's bad, that is bad, bad, I'm sorry. I, I did it on purpose but I should have asked before I did it. If we were in a larger group I would have, okay, be, but we're friends. Um, do you see how that can happen so easily though? And with her personality, she would never come up to me like some of my students did. That really hurt my feelings. She would never do that. Instead, what would she do? Withdraw. Never answer a question again. And she would say, I can't write. My teacher said, to me, I can't write. I couldn't come up with the right sentence. Okay, teachable moment, thank you. Now no one else wants to share. <laughs> that will happen too. My son used to come home and he would say to me, Mom, I just can't be in that class anymore because my teacher is so mean. Is she mean to you? No, she's mean to my friend. Okay, so Two people next to her probably have just dropped out of my class too. I mean, think about the power that we have and then use it wisely. Anyone else want to share their three words or entire sentence with me that has three words? Cat is, cat is fat. Cat is fat. Arrange black apples. One Arrange more. black apples. Arrange black apples. Okay. From that short activity, what could I tell about my students? If you were doing that in the classroom, what could you tell? The more advanced I teach readers, the they, don't, they teach the lower <laughs> grades. Cause yeah. I didn't think about some of those. <laughs> yeah, I, so their skill level exactly. And it's quick, it's fast. Um, you could have them write them on a whiteboard and just hold them up. They wouldn't have to share. Okay, teach a decoding strategy. Breaking the word apart, blending, look for chunks. It's a misconception, however, that science of reading small groups should only focus on phonics skills. In the science of reading, you can still do small groups. And they do not just have to focus on, re on phonics. And I'm afraid, I'm afraid that that's what, what we're going to gravitate to because many of us, when we think of science of reading, we think of phonics. And so if we want to implement phonics, what am I going to do in small group? Phonics. Once your students are able to decode and read fluently, your focus can change to comprehension. And that's what it should change to. But only when you're sure they can decode and you found that phonemic awareness hole or that phonic skill that they need. Science of reading tells us that comprehension is a very important part of the reading rope. Are all of you familiar with the reading rope concept? 
Okay, I'm, I saved that slide till last because I want to make sure that at least you come out of today's um, session with some of the key theories that are being um, promoted from the science of reading. So we'll talk about the, the reading rope in a minute. Okay, change how you teach high frequency words. Instead of using strategies that promote memorizing the shape or letter order of a word, consider using a process that promotes orthographic mapping to help students connect the sounds in the words to the letters. Does anyone know what orthographic mapping is? I would say it has to be something with mouth <laughs> movement. Okay. Showing how your mouth should look when you are saying a letter. Yeah. Just by the word ortho. Orthographic mapping is how students learn to recognize each letter of the alphabet and how each letter represents one sound. For example, if a student says O, when you ask them what letter that says its name, the letter O, this indicates they have acquired orthographic mapping for that sound and letter. So, um, if you were studying this, for a child that needs work on that, um, one of the techniques is to use a mirror. Have you seen that? Um, where you use a mirror and show the child how to form their mouth, so exactly, exactly what you were saying, but then it goes on to associate that with the letter and the sound. Okay. Okay, another step. Change up your guided writing. Writing is still a part of the science of reading, but there is one change that you should make if you want to align it to the philosophy of science of reading. Swap the simple sentences for decodable sentences. So, like the activity I had you do earlier, you might have two of the words in a, sent in a sentence with blanks and have them fill in another word. So, um, so that, that's one, one way to do it. Um, I didn't bring dice with me. Um, here is another, this is an activity I have used, but this is modified to the science of reading. So in my small group, I, I put children in, or people, in groups. And so this would be a group, that would be a group. She rolls the dice, it's two. So on the list, whatever we're decoding, whatever strategy skill we're l working on, she puts two words that match that. So short a vo short vowel a short a vowel the vowel short a. Um, she'd put two words. She rolls dice five. She has to put down five words. One one word. Okay. Then we take those words and we write a story. Okay. You can have fun with it. You may also hear this called dictated sentences. You will dictate a decodable sentence and the students will write it. So you can start with that. I will, I do want to tell you one of the fastest way, ways to pick up um, dyslexia or the same idea in math. If you put things on the board and you ask students to copy or if you say it and they don't do it correctly, they mix it up and you can see that very quickly, then, they, then you need to work with that student, not on skills, but there's something else going on, dyslexia or um, dysgraphic. I learned that when I was teaching algebra 
and I'd put a problem on the board and then I'd have the kids work it and I'd be around looking at them and students would have the wrong answer because they had the wrong problem because when you suffer from from that every time you look back at the board you see something different so the same thing is true when you're copying from a book you see something different and so they did the math right they just didn't copy the problem correctly in more advanced guided reading groups you can have the students write about the story that you read and then they can write to retell what happened write about the problem and solution or just write the facts they learned this type of guided reading is powerful for two reasons works on comprehension and they'll naturally be working on encoding the words because they're writing about a decodable book they'll have to write those phonics words to retell the story So, if you're using guided reading aligned to science of reading, or the other way around, however you want to put that heading up there, notice how similar, when you outline it, this is kind of like backwards outlining, notice how similar guided reading and the science of reading actually are. Teaching point, introduce vocabulary, read the book, discuss the book, and write. We'll come back to this, but I want to make sure that we look at the reading rope. For those of you who are not familiar with it or would like a reference, um, the philosophy is that reading, it's, it's not called Scarborough's reading string, meaning that you start with phonics and you go to comprehension it's not called the long string it's called the reading rope i'd like you to look at the date on that we've been practicing this a long time and yet i hadn't heard of the reading rope until fairly recently but it's been out there a long time okay so it means that um, everything gets woven into a rope language comprehension includes facts background knowledge it in includes concepts <coughs> It wasn't until a young man I was tutoring to improve his ACT test score said to me, we were reading Wuthering Heights, and of course I was thrilled because I, I love Wuthering Heights, and he said, he, just, he didn't get it. He just didn't get it. And so I was trying to explain to him, and he said, he said Wait a minute. Have you ever been in love? Okay, I wasn't a lot older than he was. I mean, enough older, but not a lot. <clears throat> and I said, well, actually, I have. And he said, so have you ever been hurt because of love? Yeah, I have. So then I thought, okay, he's going to tell me about a breakup. He said to me, I just want to tell you, I'm 17 years old. I've never been in love. And even when I thought I was, I've never been hurt because I always did the dumping. He said, I have no idea what this story is about. He didn't. 
How can a 17-year-old truly have any background knowledge for that? I may have shared with you um, when I was in Omaha, um, I had a friend whose husband was the principal of a school they were going to close because those were the days when we were closing schools for low test scores. And so she said, do you think you can go in and just talk to him? I said, sure, love to. So I went in and he, very, very nice person. And he said to me, will you just go in the classrooms and observe and I said, sure, I'd be glad to. So I did, and the teachers were great, and I had a, I really enjoyed my time there. I went into his office, and he said to me, okay, Patty, tell me what my teachers are doing wrong. And I said, uh, that's your first mistake with me. Your teachers aren't doing anything wrong. And he said, I didn't mean, and he didn't mean it the way it sounded, but that that's what he had been hearing at all the district meetings, you know, what are your teachers doing that your kids are getting such low test scores? And I said, you're in the poorest school district in Omaha. These kids don't have any experience in what they're reading, none. And I learned that lesson from my Wuthering Heights kid. And he said, well, what do we do? And I said, well, I think we need to give them experience. I think we need to give them some background for what they're they're reading okay how do we do that well so the teachers and i and he got together and the next year we didn't change curriculum at all we didn't really even change what we were teaching what we did was take field trips and when we couldn't take field trips we watched videos mm -hmm. his test scores the school's test scores went up immediately he was principal of the year not because his teachers changed what they were doing, but we changed experience for the kids. Background knowledge is extremely important. Give you another example of that. I did a lot of work in Saipan. Saipan was using journeys. Journeys. <coughs> I was working in a second grade classroom. The story was about a pet dog. The pet dog was getting in bed with the little boy. I mean, you know, sleeping on the edge of his bed or whatever. So I'm helping this little boy, second grader. Um, we're working on comprehension. So I said, and I thought I knew something about the culture in Saipan. Another mistake I made. Um, I said to him, so do you have a pet dog? And he said, well, we did. And I said, oh. You can, my frame of reference. And he said, then my brother had a birthday. What? That's what they had for birthday dinner. Oh. I went to the teacher after class. And he, so he said to me, do you have a dog? Mm -hmm. Does he sleep with you? No. Are you gonna have him for a birthday dinner? No. <clears throat> I went to the teacher after class and I said, we're not reading that story ever again here. That story means nothing to these children. They have, uh, what are they, bonies. So they have wild dogs that they feed and eat. The teacher said, Patty, I don't think I can skip a story. I said, I'll write the company. You can skip this story. There is no need to try to, I mean, how could he possibly comprehend that story when that is not his background? Unless she did some pre-teaching. So background knowledge is extremely important to me. Vocabulary still have to teach vocabulary. Language structure, syntax, how sentences are put together, verbal reasoning, and this is a tough one. Um, metaphors, similes, those are tough. Genres, I'm recommending, uh, I'll share with you 
uh, in a minute. Um, I recommend that you find different genres on the same topic, on the same theme, and use those in, the, in your reading routine. And then word recognition, um, phonemic awareness, decoding, sight recognition. And then you weave all those together. They become strategic and automatic. I am in awe of the human brain and how we can speak and how we can read and how we can just do things automatically without thinking about them. But there was one time we had to think about it. We, didn't, we weren't born talking and walking. We had to learn that. And now it's automatic. Wouldn't it be wonderful if reading was like that for all of our children, for all of our adults? But again, I want to go back to Scarborough wrote this book in 2001, not in 2021. We've been doing this a long time, so don't let the science of reading scare you. Don't think you have to throw everything out. You don't. And remember that you are the expert. You are. Not your textbook, not me. You are. Okay, so now, if you don't have questions, I'm going to ask that you put it all together. And I am going to give you my example of a science of reading, reading routine, a five-day reading routine. So the first day you do your pre-teach, or the first step, I guess it's a five-step. First day you do background knowledge set up the theme. It's thematic teaching. So set up your theme, set up background knowledge. Second step is vocabulary, pre-teach vocabulary. It's step two. I, I'm actually going to give you six steps, so you kind of have to decide, does vocabulary go in your first day or your second day? The third step is, I'm going to call it a read aloud slash think aloud. Some people will call it a close read. But during that time, I want you or a recording, I don't care, but I want you to give an example. I want you to read at least part of the story aloud. And I want you to do think alouds based on the skill you're teaching. So if I were reading something and I were doing short, the short vowel A, I would say, oh, there's a, there is a sh word that has a short vowel in it. Think out loud, talk out loud what you as a good reader think. There are several ways to do that, and that's a whole nother class, but um, so very briefly, you can um, use post-its, you can use a worksheet, a fill in the blank, a note sheet. The next step is a close read where you ask the children to read independently. 
And during this time, you should be listening for whisper reads. You should be asking comprehension questions. You should be asking for textual evidence. The next step is writing. You can use some of the same prompts that you used in the previous step to expand the writing or some of the things that we talked about earlier. And then the last step is assessment. Whether that be formative or summative is where you are in the teaching cycle. Okay, that's a very broad overview of how I do it. What I'd like you to spend the, the next half hour doing, because I do want to share this, I want you to develop either your own reading routine because I would like you, when you, in an ideal world, when you go back to the classroom, I'd like you to have developed your reading routine so that you can share it with the students and you can post it. Um, I'll give you an example, I'll tell you why. Um, classroom management from day one says that we all need to know what to expect. I. Uh, when I, particularly when I travel, um, I go to church on Sunday as often as I can. But traveling, I go to unfamiliar churches. When I first started traveling, that made me very uncomfortable. Not because I was uncomfortable being there, but I didn't know what we were going to do. I didn't know when to stand up, when to sit down. And so rather than concentrating on the sermon or the message that was being delivered, I was concentrating on watching everyone else. We develop routines for a reason. So children particularly need to know their routine. In classroom management, in, in raising kids, um, you, need, you need to prepare them for what to expect. So when you're going to the grocery store and you're taking your kids with you, you say to them, we're going to go to the grocery store. Mom has to get something for supper tonight. Do you know they don't call supper, supper everywhere? Anyway, um, mom has to get something for supper. Uh, we're going into the store, we're getting that, and we're going out. We are not going shopping. We're going in and we're going out. Otherwise, they think we're going Saturday shopping. And up and down every aisle and putting, you know, okay. So if you develop your reading routine, and it doesn't have to be specific, but it has to be general. The children know what to expect. They know where we're going to get. Right brain people need to see the big picture. I need to read the end of the book before I can start. I need to know, even in the book I just read, um, It Ends With Us, I had to read the last chapter and thank goodness I did, or I would have never gotten through the book. And it's an easy read. I needed to know what was going to happen. Or emotionally, I can't get through, I can't, get, I can't do it. That's why I taught algebra backwards. The kids need, uh, we need to know. And if I know where I'm going, if I know that, and that I'll get there eventually, then I can make the journey. They need the reading routine so they know what to expect. That means you have to do some planning. You have to do some, some strategic thinking. What will work for you? You can modify it, 
but you can't change it unless, I mean, of course you can change it, but then you have to share that with your children. You have to take down. Um, when I work for, when I deliver professional development for a company, I have to come up with an agenda and it puts minutes. Notice I didn't even give you an agenda. I told you where we were going, but if I, because I'm telling you there are teachers in other part of the country will say, you said 10 minutes and it's been 11, move on. I mean, there, there really are people that'll do that, or really, uh, you were supposed to spend 20 minutes on there and the only 19. Yep, okay, not gonna do that. So um, I would use post-its maybe and then put post-its on, um, on your reading routine. Today we're going to, today we're going to. Kids will adapt, but they need, they need some consistency. And I'm telling you, particularly now in their lives, they need some consistency. Okay, so I would like you now to, you can come up with a reading routine, or you can take a lesson that you have in your head and, or in your bag, and change it to align with the science of reading. Or at least map something out. How am I going to change this unit on dinosaurs that I have taught for 110 years and I can do it? How am I going to change that now to align with the science of reading? Or, you can write yourself a list of things that you need to do before school starts in reading. Find 25 decodable books, think of themes to do, you know, whatever. But I'd like you to take about, well now I've talked, um, because I'd like to share these. So we have until noon, um, I think, and then, uh, so if we have 15 minutes to share, that's probably good. You get two minutes or three, whatever. Okay? And I'm around to help, give you ideas. You can work as a group. You don't have to work individually. This is a pig activity. Um, pair, individual, or group. That, I used to do that in my classroom all the time. I had a laminated pig, and whenever I didn't care, I just put that on, well, in those days, an overhead, and the kids knew. Oh, I can work with a partner, or I can work individually, or I can work with a group. It's a pig activity. Thing that you'd like more information on or anything like that. Um, here is another little trick that I learned from someone. And I don't always do this because of circumstance, but I made a point of doing it in my classroom. When I am the expert, I stand up. So when I'm standing up, that means that you need to listen to me. When I'm not, I sit down. And so my kids always knew that when I was standing up, that meant I probably knew more about what I was talking about than they did. But when I sat down, it meant I don't have a clue. Or I'm learning right along with you, is what I would tell them. And so they, really, they respected that a lot, I think. But again, they were seniors in high school, so they understood. But lots of times we'd be discussing a novel, and they'd say something, and I'd sit down right in the middle of class. OK, we need to talk about this, because I don't know what you're doing. Let's talk about it. I'm learning. OK, anyway, so I'm learning now. So who would like to start? We um, just spent some time looking at CKLA. And it's based, I mean, it's a ton of stuff to get through in one day. But it basically has all the steps already incorporated into it. It just might be like we talk about tweaking it to make sure that we're doing it correctly and devoting enough time to each step and not just rushing through to get it done because we have to get through the lesson. How are you, if I can ask, how are you evaluated? As far as, like, every three years, you mean? 
So it's every three years now yeah. in Iowa? And so how does that evaluation take place? What are the criteria of the evaluation? We choose either reading or math, and then they watch and they look for the eight teaching standards. They, so it's on it's standard based. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like the Iowa eight professional standards. Okay. Okay. So it's not based on student test scores. No. no. And it's not based on how much material you got through. No. Okay. Okay. Good to know. So. Where does the pressure come from to finish in a certain time frame? Our school board's pushing us to get our scores up. Okay. And that's part of the reason why we got new parking. Please know that with the science of reading, remember that step that said you can't move on until mm -hmm. you know? So be careful that that in my opinion, that that doesn't turn into independent study where I go at my own speed because if I don't want to go fast, I won't. If I do, I will, but if I don't, I won't for children. Does that make, do you under, does that make sense to you? Yes, and it's tough too in our district because we have five or six sections of each grade at the lower and then four at the upper and they want us to stay together. So like uh, one classroom might be struggling and then everybody else is ready to move on. So then it's just kind of like, oh, well we have to move on because they, they want to make sure like families, because we have so many mixed families that live with each other or twins or, or just things in general. They want to make sure we're cohesive to get our scores up. That uh, that's not sure. too because it's like, well, if my class is lower and we're struggling, what do we do? Um. The first time I got in trouble with a principal was when I was doing my internship in math. And um, in the morning I was a student teacher and in the afternoon I was a real teacher paid. Um, so things haven't changed a lot since then, I guess. But um, so I had to turn in lesson plans. And of course, in those days, the lesson plans were turned in a week ahead of what you were doing. And so probably the second week I was there, um, my lesson plan repeated because I was teaching math. So it, I didn't get as far as I thought I was going to, so I had to repeat. And <clears throat> I got called into the principal's office and we had, in the Sheldon Middle School, we had one office and all the science and math teachers had a desk in that room. And I came upstairs and I was crying because the principal just told me that I'd never be a good teacher if I had to repeat lessons. and. And I walked in and um, my supervising teacher in the morning said to me, oh, Patty, we forgot to tell you, you lie on your lesson plans because he doesn't believe that you should ever repeat. My guess is you told the truth on your lesson. Yeah, I did. And so he said, oh no, by the end of the year, our lesson plans are weeks off because we have to lie. Oh. Okay. So what that did for me professionally is I hated doing lesson plans. I mean, I had that fear that, so um, I was, again, very lucky to have a supporting principal, and he helped me through that because he would say, yeah, sometimes you don't get as far as you, you need to. You know, you have a fire drill. You didn't have class. We have snow day. I mean, it happens. Don't. I think that's what's nice about our small mm -hmm. school is that we, every year is different depending on the kids. And so sometimes we spend, you know, two weeks longer on a, a unit because they just get changed. Their kids are they're they're struggling. Yeah. 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 The next year, maybe we might take those two weeks off. That's what we time. Yeah. That time. I'm hoping that that might have been one good thing that came of the pandemic is that we realized flexibility is necessary. Okay, do you have any questions that you'd like answered or anything or anyone else want to share from this table? Okay, thank you. This table? We just did a lot of discussion on differences in the schools and what has worked in the past, what hasn't, what we want to look at changing. 
you know, um, Jenny and I are going to start our letters training on August 1st. So I kind of feel like we need to go in and maybe read a little bit more about what it is and, and read a little bit more on the science of reading so we are more prepared um, mindfully to receive that information because we know that it's going to be intense according to what we've yeah. been told and we know that we're going to have to have a lot of changes um, in our room. Um, letters is gaining a lot of momentum right now because of the science of reading so um, I think you will be joining a, a wide community of teachers so I would suggest that you look at some of the blogs that they they put out you know just to get an idea of what what feelings are out there um, and again it is my professional advice that if you are moving to a prescribed curriculum that the first year you do exactly what they tell you to do and take voracious notes. This I think I could do differently. This I'd like to add to. This didn't work for me at all. Take voracious notes, but pretty much prescribe to what they tell you to do. Because um, if you implement with integrity and it doesn't work, then you can have a good case for making some adjustments. If you do not implement with integrity, you, don't, you really don't have a leg to stand on. Um, even though I would trust you professionally in your professional judgment, in this day and age, we need evidence to support. Okay, thank you. Okay, I have a thank you there. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that you um, gained something. I hope that, if nothing else, I challenged your mind to think about things in a little bit different way. And please know I am, I am always available to support you. I'm an email or a phone call away. I changed the PowerPoint so that you have the right phone number. It is 402-250-7168. And my email is Patricia underscore A underscore Duncan, D-U-N-C-A-N, because in Oregon they spell it D-U-N-K-I-N. I'm from not... Oregon, I mean I am, but at msn.com. So it is my pleasure to introduce to you Annie Winston. I came to know Annie because she is a very valued member of the VOOCS um, Educational Advisory Board. And since then we have become, I would consider, close friends. And she is going to share some delightful stories and wonderful books. She is an author. She is... She has her own company, a nonprofit, and does remarkable work with children and with teachers. Um, and she's just a really good, good person. Oh. Um, she could be from Iowa. Okay. okay, great. Thank you. Well, I always have this thing about Nebraska. That's where my daughter lives. And I go, there's something about Nebraska where people are just nice. So Nebraska nice. So maybe we can say Iowa nice. So anyway, it was, I'm really honored to be here. It's really, I, I love teachers. I love that you guys are powerful influencers for children. So just a curiosity about your, are you like elementary, all elementary, K through five? Okay, good, good. Well, I think you are in such a powerful position as teachers. I was a teacher for a while, and then I ventured off into other things. So um, Patty wanted me to share kind of my life story. Um, and I'll say that I'm an identical twin. And um, through a series of interesting events, not necessarily planned, um, when I was 17 years old, I was very um, despondent about life. Didn't quite know direction. Kind of did not uh, feel like I had um, just a lot of skill with uh, keeping myself looking good. Um, <laughs> you know, so I was flipping through a Seventeen magazine one night, and I thought, you know what? I think if I were to have a makeover, then maybe that would give me the confidence. I had just gotten one of these Mean Girl 
you know, moves uh, going into my senior year where I was unfairly treated by uh, the senior graduating cheerleaders when they went to evaluate my skills as a cheerleader after being on the junior varsity squad for a year. Um, they just conspired like true mean girls to make it so that I would not pass the basic eliminations. In other words, I don't have coordination. And I'm like, wait a minute, you know, I can do this. But for them, it was not the case. It was just one of these mean girl moves. So I was devastated by that. So um, part of my motivation for even wanting to do something with my life, there were things at home that weren't great. But um, I thought, maybe if I have a makeover, that will just be like, take me that edge up. Um, since I wasn't going to be cheerleading in my senior year or having much of a social life because of that. Um, so I thought, but you know, twins, I mean, just me writing in as a single person for getting um, a position um, of a makeover story was likely, highly unlikely. But I had an angle. Um, I had an identical twin. So I thought, why don't they do a twin makeover story? So I'm, a f I'm an idea person. So I wrote them this story idea and sent a snapshot of my twin sister and I. And the story idea was to do a makeover right and wrong story. So one twin would overpluck the brow, another would just do it correct. Or one twin would put you know, garish, gross makeup on, the other one would get it right. So anyway, I sent that off and I get a phone call from the beauty editor about three months later, senior beauty editor, Andrea Quinn, and she says, hey, we got your letter, we think it's a darling idea, we'd love to fly out from New York to meet you and your twin sister. Now this is, you know, someone from a very small town, you know, going nowhere life, after all I lost the cheerleading opportunity, um, and I was just, oh my goodness, I'm on the cover of Seventeen, you know, in my mind, you know, only a 17-year-old could think like that. So, um, when we went in to Hollywood to meet them, um, about a week later, they flew out with their beauty team, and they liked my sister and I. We were full of energy, full of naivete, and that was perfect for their story. Um, what did we know? So we spent over a week on the beach of Laguna, the beach on Malibu, and they just photographed us. Probably took 10,000 photos. We had a four-page beauty spread graduating in June. Um, I won't say the year, <laughs> but um, we, that was my life. I thought, wow, you know, here I am. So eat your heart out, mean girls. <laughs> I'm in Seventeen Magazine. Um, but it was awkward for me because I'm really kind of camera shy. I don't really like that scene, but it was sort of an attempt to feel better about myself. Well, that then launched us on, we got signed with a big major modeling agency. So my twin sister and I got with Nina Blanchard and in the 80s, it was the Cheryl Teague, the Christy Brinkley, the Renee Russo, and there we were, the Brown Twins, um, there in the magazine, and we were a special category, but I felt like, wow, I got my photo next to these rock stars, superstar models. Um, that was kind of cool. But we started going on interviews for twin gigs, and um, we got, you know, here and there, then some. Um, then, uh, after about a year, my dad, who just passed this weekend, so Saturday. I didn't think I was gonna cry, but he drove us in to meet with these different casting directors because, you know, it's an evil world out there with, you know, young, naive girls, you know, the casting couch stories and the predators that are in Hollywood, but maybe it wasn't as much then as it is now, but maybe it was just more covered up. But my dad served as a protector for us. Um, and that was cool. And so we got some gigs here and there, but my mom wasn't so happy about us being twin models. Um, it wasn't like she said, well, go to college, because she told me <laughs> she wasn't going to pay for college. So go figure it out. There wasn't a lot of support that way for my sister and I. So um, then um, one night my mom was very upset with me and I was upset with her. And We had the kind of family dynamic where we couldn't bring feelings to the table. It was either if you're, not, if you're sad, you better get happy now. 
So I was sad, I was mad, she was trying to say, just go get a real job. But I was thinking, this is my dream, we're getting gigs, you know, we're getting a little bit here and there, but she wanted me to get a nine to fiver. And for a creative like me, that's like, you know, a, you know, like, like Auschwitz, you know, just terrible, because I just wanted to do something that was like out of the ordinary. I don't know, which is always in my soul to do that. So with that, I got angry at her and did a very unkind gesture behind, gesture behind her back. And I won't say what that gesture was. I'll let you guys imagine that. But she turned around and saw me. And that made her cry. For the first time um, that I, I realized, man, I got some anger towards my mom. This is not a good scene. I had just, I just turned 19. We were doing the modeling gig uh, for about a year. So it was our graduating year. Um, and I cried myself to sleep, just threw myself on the bed. I, like, I felt awful. I had done something so unkind towards my mother, but yet it was out of sheer frustration that she was trying to kill the dream. So um, I, I have faith. And at that time, I wasn't necessarily a person who was knowing about who God was, but I knew that when I looked out at the stars that there was somebody who made them. There had to be. So I just said, whoever made those stars, you got to help me. I got to get out of this house. And that was my honest to God prayer. I didn't know anything theology wise about who God was, but I just knew that somebody had to make those stars because they were pretty awesome. Well, the next morning, without any prior discussion, my parents came to my twin sister and I and said, we're done. We're moving you out. Now, we were 19, but we were going on maybe 12 in terms of development emotionally because we had been kind of warehoused as kids. And um, so that was, but I was excited. I didn't know what I should have known. Um, and my mom says, well, if you can't make your modeling career work, then you're going to have to get forced, you're going to be forced to get full-time jobs or live curbside. The choice is yours. Well, gee, mom, thanks. But I was excited. My dad was you know, he was excited for us, but he, my mom kind of ruled the roost. She was the matriarch of the family. My dad was kind of her sick dog when it came to how we were treated, you know. But that's a whole other thing. So we were thrilled. So we found our first apartment. My mom and dad, they paid our first and last month's rent, bought us a week's worth of groceries and says, go figure it out. And we were thrilled. I even brought all my stuffed animals and put them on my bookshelf. You know, I was still so young at heart. But I was so grateful that um, we were able to land some significant jobs that, and one of them was the Double Mint Gum commercial. So as far as us getting a job, that paid us a pretty sweet you know, royalty check because it ran, it was national, for about two, three years. So every time that thing played, I knew there was a check coming in the mail. So that's how we got started in the modeling. So I did the whole modeling thing. We get traveled to Europe. We did Prel. We did a lot of work. We got our SAG after cards. And that supported me. But I wasn't, that really wasn't me. It was a means to an end. And I couldn't wait to figure it out. And as far as my faith journey, um, I came to understand that that God who made the stars was the person who created me. His name was Jesus, so I came into a relationship with him later, and that gave me some, some real grounding that I had an identity that wasn't just based on my appearance, it wasn't just based on my talent, but there was somebody that actually loved me. That was a hard concept for me to get my head wrapped around, um, just given my, my growing up years. So all of that to say, Patty, there's my double mint gum story. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay, so I bring a lot of, um, and for me, fun is the operative word in life. Because um, without fun and joy, especially when it comes to relating to children, because I'm really just a big kid at heart. That's kind of me. I just have never grown up. I still have that 10-year-old that's very alive and well in me. And if something is not fun, I'm like done. I'm do over this. Sorry, Patty, but you've got to know that about me, that fun is where it rocks for me. But Patty's brilliant in her research, and she has such a way of taking concepts that are difficult, but bringing them into a, a framework that you can understand. So I appreciate that about Patty very much. But me... It's, this character is me. Um, I wrote this book as part of the vision I had for my jazz about reading. I wanted kids to read great books. That's my heart. Because I think that, that it isn't so much the theory of reading as much as it is the experience of reading, the sharedness of it. Because I don't think that, um, that 
we remember things in terms of, of, of sharing and experience. And, and my parents were not sharing the reading experience with me so much. It was me escaping some kind of grim realities in my home through books. So my mom did do something right. She got me a library card. And you guys seen the Matilda movie? Okay, I was kind of like a Matilda. The parents were like, my mom especially was like, go oh, figure it out, change your own diaper. I mean, not that extreme, but pretty much, you know, we put a roof over your head, there's some food on the table, but you got to figure it out. Um, but thankfully, she did get me that library card. So that was what really propelled me to see a whole world. I loved biographies. I loved stories of mystery. I loved like the boxcar children. I loved anything where there was adventure. So my reading was born of that. And of course, Roald Dahl was one of my favorite authors uh, during my early reading years. But what it told me was that a good book, a great book that's full of imagination and great characters and story and, and, and characters who have problems, who overcome them, is a light, is a kind of light for a child. Um, because without story, I mean, our lives, we're always looking for that frame to figure out, okay, what f where do I want to live in my story? And so when we read stories, we reflect and see a little bit of ourselves in some of those characters. So as a, as a, as a child growing up in a pretty gray world of routine, um, the, the reading was such a lifeline for me. So now as in my, in my journey, I, I want to share that passion so, uh, with, with, with others, especially with children. So I um, wrote this book uh, about three, three years ago as part of um, my kind of the signature character for my reading nonprofit, Jazz About Reading. And I was able to uh, get the SpongeBob artist, Heather Martinez, to do all the art for it. And uh, Patty enjoys this story. Kids enjoy the story of Ivan. I'm going to read it to you here. And then some of my th philosophy of how to turn a reluctant reader into a ravenous one is implicit in this story. Um, so we'll talk about that. I have, I have more slides than you probably want to see. But I, I hope that we'll just keep the conversation going. And I want, I want your feedback too, because I want to hear from you and, and just to, you know, um, see how we can make this kind of a dynamic process so I'm just not a, a complete talking head up here, that you can feel my heart and I can hear your heart too, because I'm sure you have amazing strategies that have worked in your classrooms. Okay, so um, with that being said, I will get on to the next slide. Uh, do you have any questions about anything right now, just in my comments and what I've said or anything? Okay, great. All right, and I'm not a techie, so if I can like turn the slide here, I'll be really happy. Oh, there we go, okay. Discussion points, okay. Wait, I don't want it to stop. Okay, well, that was where we're going to go. Okay, so here's the book. So, all right, so there's Ivan. There was once a penguin named Ivan. His full name was Ivan von Penguinski. It was a very proper name for a very gifted penguin who had a special talent for music. One of the things that... Um, Okay, from the time Ivan pecked himself out of his shell, he mastered a most unusual instrument, his mouth. Out of that small cavern, he created an orchestra of musical sounds. He brayed, he clicked, he clucked, he clacked, he thumped, he twittered, jiggered and whistled. Sounds and rhythms popped into his penguin brain like popcorn in an iron kettle. And I love how uh, Heather was able to capture, you know, the emotion of my character, the vulnerability of Ivan. And I think one of the things, just in commenting about my thought in creating this character, is that kids think, well, I'm really good at video games. I'm really good at, you know, baseball or basketball. Why do I need reading? And for Ivan, his really good thing was, was um, music. He could, he could compose. He had a dream. So, um, but I want kids to understand that, yes, you have certain talents, but reading is a key to help you achieve those dreams. Um, you will only be better reading with those dreams. Okay, so one day while Ivan was belly sliding, he saw a strange something poking out from a pile of snow. Ivan hurried over to the snow bank and pulled out the strange something. It was an oblong box. He cautiously opened it. Ivan's eyes widened and his heart skipped. There in soft red velvet lay an instrument he had only heard of, but had never seen or touched, a violin. 
He carefully held it and began to stroke the strings with a bow. What came out were squeaks and squawks, but with Ivan's gift of music, the squeaking and squawking quickly turned into smooth, lovely sounds. The beautiful sounds were heard by a pair of penguins, Ivan's parents, who were shuffling their way back to the colony. They stopped and turned to see a silhouette in the distance. It's Ivan, they gasped, flapping their flippers. After Ivan's little concert on the snow, his parents decided to send him to the finest music academy in Antarctica. Ivan was so excited, he waddled in circles until he rolled over with dizziness. Soon Ivan was going to the academy every day after school. He was so jazzed about music, it was all he could think about. Ivan woke up tapping his webbed feet and went to bed tapping them too. Most importantly, Ivan had a dream, a big dream. He wanted to be a great orchestra conductor. Ivan often picked up a long icicle and waved it, ar waved it around, imagining himself conducting the famous Antarctic Symphony. To be a great conductor, he thought he should learn to play every instrument. Of course, that was almost impossible, but Ivan tried. He soon played the violin, the trumpet, the trombone, the flute, the saxophone, the kettle drums, and the tuba. But with all of Ivan's genius for music, there was one thing that did not come easily to him, reading. Ivan hated it, hated it as much as eating rotten squid. When Ivan's teacher called on him to read aloud in class, he would fake a coughing fit and make a waddled dash to the water fountain. Not wanting to read books wasn't because Ivan's brains were small. He simply had too much puffy in his penguin self. He believed his classmates when they said he was Ivan the musical genius. With such magnificent genius, Ivan thought he didn't need to master reading because he was already a master of music. So books were not important to Ivan. Every day he would sing a silly song. Books are boring, books are dumb, books make my brains feel like an old wad of gum. One day, Ivan's music teacher had a surprise for him. Ivan wondered what the teacher was holding behind her back. Could it be a clarinet or cassonettes? With a huge smile, the teacher gave Ivan his gift. It was a book. Ivan's heart sank until he saw the cover. His flippers trembled. There on the book's cover was Ivan's favorite conductor, Ludwig von Bederstein, The Secret of Great Conducting. This book holds the secret to becoming a great conductor, said Ivan's music teacher, smiling. Ivan thanked her and quickly put the book in his penguin pack and slid home. He plopped on his ice bed and eagerly opened the book to discover the secret. Ivan turned the first page, the second, the third, and then every page. He couldn't find the secret. There were no pictures, only words. Ivan slammed the book shut, got up, ran outside, and dove headfirst into a bank of snow. Then Ivan did something he hadn't done in a long time. He cried. His dream of becoming a great conductor now seemed impossible. When his tears froze on his cheeks, he pulled his frosty head out and shook the snow off his face in feathers. He took a deep breath, lifted his beak high, and announced, no more running away. I, Ivan von Penguinsky, will learn to read. The following day, Ivan went to his teacher and told her the truth, but she wasn't shocked because teachers are very good at understanding their students. So there's a shout out for you guys. Over the next days and weeks, Ivan came early to school and even stayed in at recess to work on his reading. His teacher helped him sound out words, and Ivan began to understand that every letter makes a sound, just like every note in music makes a sound. Do, re, mi, fa, conductor. And every day when Ivan came home, his parents took time to read a book with him. One of the things that's really important for me in my how to have a ravenous reader idea is to have it a shared experience with reading mentors, parents, fellow students, so that they make the associations of, of love, of security, of connection. So that's really key. Before long, he was happily reading words, sentences, paragraphs, and then books. I even found out that books made him laugh and cry. Books taught him things he did not know. Books could be full of heroic adventures and incredible stories. Now when his teacher called on him to read a lot in class, Ivan happily did so. 
Every evening before going to sleep, Ivan read another chapter in The Secret of Great Conducting. Then he finally found it. The secret was simply stupendous, fantastically far out, amazingly awesome, and perfectly powerful. He couldn't wait to share it. The next morning at breakfast, Ivan boldly read out loud to his parents, The Secret of Great Conducting is... Now, whenever I go to assembly or do it with the kids, I have them do the drum roll just to, you know, make it more fun. Okay, so he's the big moment, and it's passion! He paused. He had an important thought. The secret of doing anything great is passion, putting your whole mind and heart into whatever you do. Of course, without passion, everything, including reading, is boring. Ivan only became passionate about reading when he discovered it was the key to unlocking his dream. Years later, Ivan put the secret into practice as conductor of the Antarctic Symphony Orchestra. When Ivan's parents came to hear his concert, they sat in the front row, clapped their flippers, and raised their beaks high. They couldn't have been more proud of their son. Ivan had achieved his dream. From then on, Ivan von Penguinsky never forgot that the secret of great conducting is passion. And the secret of becoming a great reader is passion too. For the rest of his life, Ivan taught that very same thing to other penguins. But those are stories for another time. Oh, you didn't put the the end. I had them in the snow with a little the end on the back. <laughs> so, yeah, so I, I want kids to know that um, reading is the key to achieving their dream. So if they're a great, they have a great passion for basketball, art, awesome. There's your talent then. Understand that, that you can learn and enhance your, your abilities in those areas by reading um, books that can help you um, achieve a greater depth of your um, where your passion is. So I think, I think one of the secrets is helping kids discover their unique passion uh, for what they like, who they are. Because if reading is just about the technical, you know, getting the words, sounding them out, but the meaning and what's being written doesn't connect to them anyway, then they might as well be reading a phone book, right? So we need to make sure that they find their book is so critical for them to become passionate uh, readers, ferocious readers, ravenous readers. Okay, so what are some fun reading strategies that really work? Okay, create a friendly reading environment where the students can understand the value of reading well and how it connects and impacts their life. So reading environment's key, just making that room just like come alive with um, color and and story and there's all different ways that you know you can you can do that so strategy two keep your enthusiasm for reading very high because more is always caught than taught I think you as the teacher need to definitely model to them excitement and passion because there's something about our human nature that when someone is really jazzed and, and excited about something we want to go what is it what are you doing why you why do you like this and then we want to we want to engage because we all desire to be plugged in and alive and experiencing uh, life in a, in a way that, that feels good to us. So make sure that you're reading high. Nothing is worse than standing in front of kids and just, you know, hey, da, 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 and you don't have the oomph to it. And I think the key with that is making sure that it's not you reading to the students, but it is you reading with the students. So it's that shared experience. Um, there's, it's, it's, it's a big, it's a little like that to and with, but it's a big shift. Uh, kids know if you're you know, like this, or if you're like, yeah, let's discover together, let's have some fun, let's read a book. Okay, help students personalize their reading experience by helping them engage all their senses in what they're reading. So if you're reading a book and there's, you know, a sound that is made of a bird, then you go, let's all tweet like birds, let's all be little baby birds, you know, it's just something to make it more fun. The more that they get their senses engaged, the more you'll have them uh, with you and it'll be a fun shared experience. So allow your own freshness to the story come out. So it's just like, 
You know, it's almost like you're sitting around a campfire and let me tell you a story. Let's read this story and you're all having a good time or, or what do you think is going to happen next? And you do the dramatic pauses. So you have to just, I, I'm sure you guys all do that to some degree um, because you're teachers, but just don't ever give up on that. Um, just get them involved in as many senses. Oh, the bunny hopped. Let's all hop. You know, I know you have to keep the classroom control, but just whatever it is that gets them going. Uh, help students discover what they like to read by exposing them to a wide variety of great children's literature known to inspire, bring fun and joy to the reading. Okay, so I'm a huge fan of Royal Dahl. I mean, I think that, and I'll talk about this later, but I think if we just talk about our own favorite books, um, and what they meant to you when you were their age. I think we need to bring our 10-year-old self and our own curiosity out to the students and say, this book really transformed my reading journey because it really dialed into something deep within my own soul or with my own interest or talent. And I, I remember years ago that um, I got a letter from a mom whose son actually hated reading. He was in fifth grade, couldn't read, a, would never read a book unless his mom forced him and read it with him. So he had bought my Heroic Historicals book, uh, this one here uh, was when I first book published and it sat on the shelf for over a year and she, uh, he had to do a historical fiction report. So you know, like, oh, I gotta do this. So, oh, here's a book, Daniel Boone. So he, she pulls it off the shelf and, you know, he kind of rolls his eyes, but he looks like the cover looks interesting uh, for him with a shiny, shiny silver ship and the boy uh, looking out the window. And he represents the board student. And he has a teacher named Miss Jolie Winkle, uh, which <laughs> represents everything you don't want to be in a teacher, as a teacher. But anyway, so, um, he started, she started reading it with him. And after the first chapter, he said, Mom, you can go away. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this on my own. So it was the first book that he finished all by himself because it dialed into some part of him that he just enjoyed. It was, and, and I, I took away from that when she wrote me this letter, and I don't know, where that letter is, somewhere in my Yahoo account with 500,000 emails, so I don't, probably will never find it, but um, I just I remember thinking, wow, that is it. Just find where they itch and scratch it, what their own curiosity is, and encourage them. Um, even if it's Captain Underpants, they're reading, they're, they're engaging, they're doing something. So, um, and then here, is a book, this is not the letter that was written to me, but I just, I've always liked this book because she wrote this. She goes, Dear Annie Winston, I really licked your book. It was so funny, it made me laugh. And I want to ask you if you're going to make one with the same character. I am your bright angel. And then she says, you know, heroic historicals, it's great news. You know, so I mean, when you could touch a heart and your kid is actually emotionally engaged with something that they're reading, that they're laughing, they're having fun, they're identifying with a character, that's their sweet spot. And you want to encourage that sweet spot. So, um, more of those sweet spots. Okay, strategy number two, create a friendly reading environment. Um, okay. Um, students create posters of their favorite books and carries, put them in around the class. It could be called the Book Hall of Fame, which I think is great because kids love to do art. So I think you would just, just like there's movie posters, you have book posters and you have your favorite books and the kids might, you know, draw even this Captain Underpants or, you know, Charlie and Chocolate Factory, but they just make a teaser about it. They say, why kids should read this book? Because it's got the coolest, most awesome character, or, you know, Charlie gets to eat all this chocolate and he gets to, like, own this factory at the end. Just make it so that kids, kids experience their books that are highlighted with posters that they do as a way to recruit others in their classroom because, you know, people want to, like Harry Potter, you know, everybody had to love Harry Potter when that came out. Um, but just to highlight something that really t 
touch them in, in a meaningful way. So just call the Book Hall of Fame, but it's their own personal classroom um, books that they've read that they want to encourage their fellow students. And I think that one of the things that's so important, again, is reading is a shared experience. I'm going to keep coming back to that point, that um, you want to make this like a community thing. Like, did you hear, oh, man, this character, oh, he reminded me of, you know, just get them talking in a natural way about books. I mean, the kids talk about movies, oh, man, Spider-Man, Superman, all these superheroes, you know, but let's, let's bring the book conversation back. And I think having a book hall of fame is one way to possibly do that, okay? Um... Teacher can wear a special Dr. Seuss Bartholomew type feathered hat whenever they be allowed. So just again, keeping the fun in it. So if you're reading a book about you know the cat and the hat, um, bring a you know hat or you know or just something or if, you know the scene where um, you know he's getting crazy with his icing, trying to wipe it off everything. Um, you might bring you know a piece of cake with pink icing. Just something just to engage them even more into the reading experience because it's shared you know kids are are um they're like fun that's what their language is is fun and if you want them turned on to reading you gotta bring in them fun and so whatever you can do to help do that in a, in a classroom environment um have a classroom storybook corner each child would build their own reading library and have their own reading journal yeah so um just that kids, I'm sure a lot of you probably already do this, but just to personalize reading, like one kid might be really into books on dinosaurs, another kid might be really into books on, you know, uh, building and construction or, or biographies or whatever it is that helps them, um, you know, have their own unique taste. Just like, I mean, I really love hamburgers. I hate hot dogs. I really, you know, hate broccoli, but I love Brussels sprouts. You know, the same kind of thinking just goes into the book world. You know, I really like this kind of character, but I really don't like that kind of character. So just helping them discover their own preference. And that's what these reading libraries would be about. And reading journals just response to the book, why they like it, draw, just make it fun. Um, okay, then cultivate the attitude that reading is a shared experience. We talked about you're not reading to the children, but with the children, enjoying as much as they are. Been making that point, okay? And um, place large letter blocks about to encourage students to spell one syllable. Okay, this is for early readers, but again, <sighs> making it fun. Like we have like a word scramble. So okay, we've got the whole alphabet here. See if we can pull out these blocks and put, you know, C-A-T, cat. This is for emerging reader type strategy for creating a friendly reading environment. Just to, I mean, I just imagining these blocks that are large and you just move them around. The more tactile they can get involved and see, um, and engage with words and letters, meaning that it points to um, concepts and all that. It's just super, super fun for them. Use fun wordplay and posters, creating unexpected combinations of two-syllable words such as carpet is car, pet, mountain is mount, A-N. Come up with your own tongue twisters, but still enjoy the classics like picking a peck of pickled peppers. Your own could be hairy hops on a hairy horse. Kids love stuff like that. Just wordplay. The more wordplay you can do, and you probably are probably doing a lot of that, but just let kids just know that language and story, and it's just fun. It's just so fun. Okay. Uh, never forget that reading is the beginning of a conversation with your students. Getting them to engage with the story and characters in a fun and silly, fun and silly ways is important for their comprehension of the material. Playing instrumental music that reflects the theme and mood of the story, you could do that. Another way to bring in the sense could be another way to enhance a reading experience for the child. If a child is not learning, growing, and having fun, then what's the point? And I really believe that. So um, nobody likes toast without butter or jam. So we just got to make sure there's lots of butter and jam. So, um, yeah, just add, add the music, just the fun, the, all of that. So, okay, and I think I have a slide here. Remember, the goal in creating an effective and fun room environment is to foster a genuine passion for reading so that every student can discover the power, the pleasure, and the exciting purpose in learning to read well. It isn't about how many stickers or stars are on their chart for reading this or that book. It's about the sheer enjoyment of reading a story and connecting to it in a meaningful way. I can't emphasize that enough. I mean, I think we get into this whole performance thing, and some kids are fast readers, and they'll get 
20 bucks in two weeks or one week. Another kid is just struggling. But if it's measured by the stars and stickers, they're going to feel miserable. And they're going to go into their, you know, into a cocoon or to, you know, a hole and just not want to care. But if it's just about, did you enjoy your book? Did you have fun? What did you learn? And I think that that is, should be more the goal. It's not to say you can't have your stickers and stars. But maybe I'm saying you shouldn't do that. I don't know. We can talk about that, how that works. But I think the important thing is just the goal is I like this book. I learned something. I connected to it. Um, and I think that's, that should be the goal. And we don't want to hear from this person. Um, so do you guys follow me on that one? So you guys agree with me on that one? So just it's that shared experience. Patty, thought, anything? Well, we have some of, I've been with some of these people a couple of times, but one of the reason, reasons that Accelerated Reader has lost its momentum is the reward system. What, in my personal and professional career, one of, and I have a great deal of respect for Boys Town, great deal of respect. But I think one of the tragedies was when they put out 101 Ways to Praise a Child. And we started making praise junkies. It's the same thing with rewards. They have to have a buy-in to it. It can't just be a tangible reward. However, that being said, although I do it now more that I'm older, so I've earned this, so to speak, I always have said, when I go to work every day and don't get paid, then you can say I don't believe in tangible rewards. So I think there's a healthy balance. Yeah, I think so. But I think that, that kids should not be reading for the reward or the sticker they should, or, or the guilt of not doing so. But just because it's pleasurable and fun, there is a goal. And, and I think only the teacher can judge when that reward should be given. Maybe for one student it's they read a book or they read a chapter or they got through a paragraph. Give them a sticker, but it's in their own. It's not for the classroom to see, for them to weigh and measure themselves. Wow, he's got this many. I've got only this. I'm a worthless. I can't read. I don't know. I'm not going to play this game. But just in their own, their own little reading journal that they get that sticker. So when they meet their goal and only you as a teacher can determine what that goal is for that student, then you reward them, you know. Um, so does that, is that something that you think would be possible? That way it's a private thing. It's you as the teacher. Yeah, Patty. I think it's also important, as Annie has stressed, you need to show the kids you read too. And so carry a book with you. Make sure you move the bookmark so that they can tell you're reading it, sometimes even if you have to fudge because your wife is busy <laughs> during the school year. But they need to know reading is not just a school thing. Reading is reading, and we do it for fun. And all too often, and I think we do this as an educational system, we, we suck the joy right out of it. And I, I think Annie's so right on. Kids need to love it. Mm -hmm. Because if they love it, they'll do it. If they do it, they get better at it. And the better they get at it, the more they'll love yeah, it. Yeah, and they'll see, they'll see the rewards. The rewards are not, you know, the coupon from McDonald's or the Happy Star meal. Um, but it's the fact that they actually grew. They actually developed some personal self-discipline and they took away something that's important. Of course, for them, they don't necessarily see that, but you can see it with a joy. I just finished this. It was so great. Um, so, and I think it's such a personal thing for the teacher to be part of that, where it's the student and the teacher connection private having nothing to do with you know the star students who's read 50 books and the student who's read a paragraph um, so that's just a private thing and I think too Patty about the teacher sharing her love for reading and what she's reading just to say you know I read this book this week and it reminded me of just the importance of slowing down because my life is so fast that sometimes I don't smell the flowers and I think when I can take time to really digest a good book and think about it, 
I, I just feel better as a person. And, and here, here's something that I read that really got me thinking about that idea. And then you just share. And maybe that's a five minute share, two minute share. But I think role modeling and being with them instead of, you know, just coming down at them with your great wisdom and life experience, of which we all have. But kids just want to feel, you know, that we're in this together and learning and discovering. Yeah. I want to share a personal story Last, that Annie brought to my mind. Last week on Facebook, one of my former students, so, I mean, I haven't been in the Haywarden for a long time at West Sioux. And she posted one of these things, what was the last book you read? And she tagged me on it and she said, I want to know the last book you read because that's the book I want to read because I always loved what you chose to read. And that just warmed my heart because I thought, and so I wrote a little thing that said, uh, I am reading junk fiction right now just to take a break from my, doc, my PhD. And it was a great conversation, but a lot of the, my former students said, said that same thing. It was the love of reading, and that's my goal always, to instill the love of reading. We have to teach reading, but I don't think we can do it if they don't love it. Yeah, motivation drives the ability to do the hard work of learning to read. And this with my character, Ivan, the motivation of, of getting the secret of great conducting was the impetus for him to do the hard work of learning to read. He was a reading fake before, because he was so proud of his accomplishments as a, as a musician and a future conductor. Okay, so yeah, so I'm glad that we all agree on this, but if, you know, well maybe you don't always agree, but this is just how I, I think on this one. But um, yeah, so, and I think too, um, all right, so this is, kind of open discussion here. So you guys can build on some of what Patty shared, I shared. So do you, what do you think really fosters that creative, that in an environment that really creates an appetite for books, for ideas, for learning, for growing? Anyone want to share? Yeah. I think what you said about the enthusiasm. I mean, I, I bring out books of my own. This is my collection of books. I love that. You know, this is this, this is my favorite book from a childhood. Yes. You know, and then they find that they just like that. Do you give the why? Uh, sometimes, you, yeah, of course. Yeah, that's, that's cool. I love that. The more vulnerable that we can be, and not in a, I'm being vulnerable, but in a genuine, you know, they'll just be like, honey, they'll just take that in. They'll be like, wow, my teacher. Or even share our own struggles with learning to read. It was hard for me. I didn't really get it. I didn't really care. And then I got it and I started to care. Yeah. Vulnerability is, is a big thing, I think. If you can show that you're vulnerable to them, they're going to they're going to respect you more. You're going to build it. Yeah, because nobody, they, you know, nobody has all the answers. I mean, even teachers with all of our life experience. But we just, we're on that learning and growing curve too. You know, none of us have arrived. And I think just keeping the fun and the learning and growing curve is so critical for true growth. True growth. Because nobody, nobody likes, you should, the legalism. You better, how dare you, you're going to get the, it, yeah. Oh man, let's let's get that shame stuff done, gone. Okay. Anyone else have an idea for creating a fun environment? Just some of the things we do, just little things when we're reading in class from the maybe um, when we've read Sign of the Beaver, we'll bring molasses in because they talk about. Oh, nice. We have each kid taste it. If they yeah, want to. I love that. Um, you get the taste involved. Yeah. And we do that with uh, another book, Maniac Vicky, with. Uh, Butterscotch Krimpus because that was his favorite. Yeah. So we do try to bring in a lot of that. Awesome. Yeah, go ahead. I was a couple more like that to make Ooblick through kids for Bartholomew. The what? Make Ooblick. Bartholomew and the Ooblick. Oh, so, so okay. Oh, yeah, right, right. Really fun one or um, Nate the Great get this, this mystery solved because the colors are combined together. Uh huh. So we used to do frosting, the primary colors, you know, and then they would mix them together and figure out, oh, that's how you
Yeah, the more that's because so, the more connections you have with the experience of a particular book, bringing in all their senses, they won't forget. And they'll start making that. Reading is fun. I like this. This is cool. Yeah, Patty? I have, of course, you can tell which one of us is the fun one, and then there's me. <laughs> so. But she keeps me from going too far out there with her research and <laughs> tethering me down. This is um, something that I've implemented in a couple of schools that's really uh, effective. And that is, if you partner with another school, and do like the posters or do a little book review and have the kids put it in a notebook and then send it to another school and have them send you there. I love that. That's awesome. That is awesome. You know, and they'll read through that and um, you can come up with a form that says, why would you recommend this book or what did you like about this book? And we all have teacher friends who really would like to do something like that. We just never think about doing it. But it's when you implement it, it is a great. And the kids think, oh, if they read this book, I can read this book. Or, oh, I, can, I can't wait to do this. And anyway, an idea. No, I, I love that. The more you can make the reading a community experience, you know, beyond just your own classroom. Go ahead. And Annie's like, you guys heard yesterday, but I just wanted to let you know that one thing I thought was like, oh, about reading motivation was that the Reading Excellence Act back in, was it? The so reading what? Reading Excellence. Oh, yeah. Listed motivation is one of the components of a reading, of a good reading program. Right. And then they, they got left off. Yeah. Why? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, the motivation is key. And even if it's just because they like you, the teacher, and what you're doing in presenting the opportunity for them to enter into a new world, a new world, you know, the whole, what's that Disney movie? A whole new world, you know? Even play the song. Aladdin. Aladdin, there you go. But just to open up their imaginations. Because it's, it's like, you know, we only see through a little tiny peephole in life. But when you read, it gets a little bit bigger. And you get to have a little bit more enjoyment. And even if you were to bring in like a spyglass thing and put it up to your eye, well, you can see very narrowly through that. But books will broaden your vision and will help you in every area of your life. Besides building confidence. Um, okay, so we have any other thoughts on reading environment that you guys have done that has been fun? Okay, I'll move on. Um, keep your enthusiasm for reading very high. Okay, we talked about that. You got what I said. Uh, your personal passion and excitement for reading is as important as what you read. You often read the class. Dry toast can always be enjoyed if it's talked about with the attitude of being the most amazing item on the menu. Well, yeah, I don't know if I agree with that now. <laughs> But no, I mean, I think that again, this water is amazing. Oh my gosh, I'm enjoying it so much. Oh, Patty, thank you. <laughs> and I'll bet you will all want to stop and we'll have a break and get a cup of water, right? Because we just, I just talked about it like, oh man, love water. Oh, it's so good. So that's, even though it's just water, there's no flavoring. Um, but the point is, it's your attitude. You bring what it is to the reading journey. So, um, yeah, so just, and that's with the parents here. Remember, students need to discuss what's not necessarily written. Okay, don't be too concerned with efficiency and quickness in getting through a book as you are enjoying the book with your students, having engagement and fun while doing so. Okay, I think it's easy. I know teachers were always so busy, right? But just take that time to digest the book. I mean, if we shove food in our mouth, our digestion is going to be very poor, but if we take time to chew it carefully, have fun, enjoy, then um, and then I think that the discussions that you have, it's not necessarily on the the book, you know, words itself, but the ideas that they represent that could help enhance the reading experience for the child. Um, it's kind of off, you know, in the white spaces of the book. And I know you guys know that as teachers because I'm sure you do a great job at all that. Okay, for example, well, <laughs> how many of you have eaten green eggs with ham? Okay. 
can eggs ever be green? I mean, these are the kinds of questions that you can ask just to facilitate those kinds of, you know, in the white spaces. What would happen if an egg was green? What would you want to do with it? Probably throw it in the trash can. But then you could say I could use it for Easter. If it was, it was an open egg or a hard-boiled egg or a shelled egg, then I could dye it, a green egg, you know, and use it for Easter. Could you eat it? But again, we want kids to think, to get their little wheels turning in their minds, to think outside of what's written on the text. I think one of the problems that early readers have is thinking that because it's printed on the page, that's all I need to know. Right? Or that's everything. Or just, I mean, there's this naive understanding that we can question and we can think about the writer of those, this Dr. Seuss. So what was he thinking? What kind of person do you think Dr. Seuss is to come up with these kinds of ideas? Just to stretch them a little bit, right? And not to keep them so, like, narrow into, okay, just the text alone. So just to think outside the book is the idea. Um, Okay, the goal is to give kids a fun experience of reading and not necessarily just the story. You want to stretch their mind to think a bit outside the book. Okay. All right. Strategy number three, help students personalize their reading experience. Okay. When students are reading individually, have them use their fingers to follow the words. You know, I saw a movie last night that I would recommend you seeing, and it's called The Quiet Girl. It's an Irish film that won uh, an award, and... The little girl was neglected in her home. Her parents were too busy to connect with her. She, they show one scene where she's in a classroom, and never do this as a teacher, where you know, she's struggling to read the text, and the teacher says, well, okay. And then she points to student girl who's sitting next to her, you read. And then, of course, she's fluent. And what happened to that little girl's esteem? Right? So, but when she's in a new environment where love is there in her caregivers and there's nurturing, she develops a confidence. And the dad figure in her new environment sits her down, and as she's reading aloud to him, he says, Honey, take your finger and follow each word and sound it out. But he, it was that patience. It was that shared experience. It wasn't shame. It wasn't, I'm not as good as Sally next to me, you know. But it was, it was she then could get that confidence. So just know that, that every student, you know, um, is has their own pacing. Just like every flower doesn't open at the same time, right? Uh, the blooming is very individual. So honor that process and I think even having kids read out loud to the class versus one kid that's not as fluent can be kind of a, a bit of a shaming experience for those that don't have the easy glib of the fluency. Um, so maybe just private or Again, whatever fosters fun and encouragement. So as teachers, I don't know, how do you, let's talk about that. How do you guys resolve some of those? That's a kind of a complicated thing. Like how do we, we want kids to read aloud, but in front of a class where obviously there's some that are super like amazing fluent readers. I mean, I understand what they're reading, but they're fluent. Um, but then you got the guy that's kind of the slow turtle that is stumbling and how do, we, how do we rectify that? How can we work with that? You know, to not have a shame-based environment where the struggle, I don't know, I want to hear from you guys on that one. Or what are some strategies that have worked? Go ahead. I had a severely dyslexic student the year before and, and I would pre-read short little parts with him because he wanted to read out loud. He told his mom, dad, I, she never calls on me because I didn't want to shame him. So we would pre-read a little section, a little blurb, so he could get called on at that point, and he read that part out loud. See, that's wonderful. That's being proactive, understanding the student. You have a connection to that student. You know where they're weak. You want them to feel success, even if it's like you have pre-read that, so they can read, even if it's just one or two sentences, they can feel that confidence. I, I love that. That's, that's great. OK, bye. Um, yes, so any other thoughts on that, how to keep the shame out of reading in front of the class? 
Anyone? I I don't necessarily have a strategy that I haven't read, but I do a lot of talking with my students from day one about that we're all different. We all um, have you know different speeds and different ways of doing things, and that that's what makes us uh, unique, but yet a family, and that we support each other even when some are yes. slower and faster. And we talk about mm -hmm. you know just how we're different and that we need to support one another. Yes, right. It's not about maybe even doing the 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 the, the story of the rabbit, the hare and the turtle, right? The tortoise. You know, the super fast guy burns out, but the slow and steady. So the important thing is that I never forget this, my daughter was a swimmer. Um, and I think this is actually answers this really well. I just thought of that. Um, and she was um, at the at a swim club and um, the head coach there who was renowned Olympian coach and um, one of the very seasoned swimmers uh, had and I overheard him say this and it never I never forgot it um, he was saying I beat that guy yeah and he stopped him he said stop it did you beat your time from last meet it's a personal race it's your own journey. So when kids, you know, well, I'm faster or better than you. Stop it. No, it's have you grown? Where are you? Because maybe the guy that moves his, his self, you know, a half inch faster or more skilled is actually showing more growth than the one that easy breezy. He doesn't show any real effort because it's so easy breezy for him. So just make, make sure and keeping what you're saying is that it's a personal journey and it's just their own sense of I the only competition that you should have is with yourself am I better today in my reading than I was yesterday am I trying because I think that what's lost in education is the value of the struggle I think we're so success oriented I'm speaking to myself but to embrace the struggle. I mean, here, I'll be vulnerable here and share my journey as a new writer. When I was getting back to school, because I was in the modeling world, and, you know, dippity-doo brains, and you just wasn't learning. I had this one guy I was dating, and he was a pretty awful person now, as I think about it. Um, but the time just didn't quite understand, uh, you know, a lot of myself. But he was a Harvard philosophy major and theology. He said, you need to go to the school and get, you're an airhead is what he told me. He goes, you need to go to the school and get your education because I really can't take you seriously unless you do. Kind of that legally blonde moment, you know, where the boyfriend says, well, you're just not my type, you know, you got to get your brain on. Um, so that, that was really humiliating for me, but I knew there was truth to it. So when I started getting back into community college, getting, taking my writing classes, and I was great at the creative story stuff, but we had to write a five-page research paper. And for the life of me, I could not organize my thoughts to create a five-page research paper. And I, I just remember having to take an incomplete in the course. I felt like an absolute failure. And I remember, you know, this is when we had the typewriter days. I was living in Laguna at the time, and, and you know, I couldn't, I was trying to get in, to transfer up to a four-year university like Berkeley and here I was stopped in my tracks because I couldn't finish a five-page research paper um, and I was even dating a guy that could help me separate from that other dude uh, to help me write this paper it was it was really really awful I remember you know sitting at the typewriter with my white out going oh I can't do this I can't think a thought you know it was just like my mind was just really scattered place but I persevered and I struggled through it and I completed the paper it tended to be it was a literary analysis of a Greek tragedy and I used cited other sources it was way more complicated than it needed to be but I just needed to write a simple paper on the types of you know sperm whales or something but you know I I just it was just awful, but I made it far worse. But the point is, I got through that, that struggle. I embraced it. I crashed through my quitting point, and it gave me that strength and confidence. So yes, it took me five months to write a five-page research paper, but I learned, and I grew, and I embraced my struggle without shame. 
And then I was, I laughed because two years later I was graduating from Berkeley having written a 100 page thesis, 15 page papers, you know, like three or four during each, you know, semester. So I conquered it. But for me, it was like climbing Mount Everest, getting that five page paper done. So it's all relative, right? So I think sharing your own struggles with your students and allowing them to struggle and it's okay. It's okay. We're so success minded to our fail. I think, I think it's a very negative, a negative mindset to have is to be so, oh, the end goal rather than the process, right? And being honorable in that process, being true to yourself. Okay, um, all right, what else do I say here? Um, helps you personalize, follow the words, he comes up with a hopping mat. Okay, don't be shy about asking a question about, okay, right, we've already done that. Okay, um, the goal is to have fun, conversational exchange with reading that's unique and particular to the book, first time students. Uh, you saw an elephant, student says, yes, I saw an elephant. Teacher then replies, no, you saw a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. You then laugh and have a joyful experience with students. So just making it fun, right? No, you, what did you just read about? No, you read about an elephant. No, you read about a peanut butter sandwich. No, I didn't. How do you know? Well, let's read it. No, you see, just play with them and have fun. Kids love that. Any ideas on that? Anything about struggle, sharing the struggle, having fun? Okay. So number four, help students discover what they like to read. Okay, we've kind of talked about some of this. Um, create book teaser posters. We talked about there, because books teaching great times past. And I think exposing kids to books that are outside of just stories, right? Uh, stories of people that have been overcomers. For me, I loved the biographies. I loved reading biographies as a kid. Wow, Helen Keller, she was blind. She couldn't even figure out water until her teacher, Annie Sullivan, poured her passion in her and she learned and she grew and she became accomplished. That was awesome. Or, you know, Wilma Rudolph, the runner, you know, who had crippled in her legs and she crashed through her quitting point. See, I think that the power of a testimony, of a biography, of an overcomer, for kids that have struggles, we all have struggles, is so, it's like a B12 shot for them. So feature those, you know, types of books in your classroom too, and giving them exposure to art, music, science, chemistry, biology, physics, engineering, just great books. So I want to hear some of your great books, ideas for, how many of you guys expose a lot of your kids to a lot of different kinds of books? There's some really great biographies now out there. Um, a lot of the publishers have really gotten into that. Which one? Who was? Who was series is really good. Yeah, I, I just love that. So helping because I think kids don't understand the value of the past and individuals who contributed meaningfully to their particular you know area of of knowledge and and accomplishment that they also can find something that they can contribute meaningfully out of their uniqueness. I think it's super important to do that. Are we good? Do we need a break here? Are we good? Right. Okay, so why don't we take a break here, um, take some water and whatever, but are we having fun? Is this fun for you guys? Yes. Are you learning? Okay, because I gotta, I gotta do what I'm asking you to do. Okay, so there's much available content on Linda up because it's easy, okay, all right. Um, so in the, in the book poster things, since most kids won't have a lot of books that would interest them in maybe science or music, or maybe they would, but just make sure that the book posters reflect a variety of areas of knowledge, not just, you know, the children's literature, which of course, you know, stories are, we all love stories, but just to expand that, that books and knowledge, gaining knowledge, real understanding about the world, about the different disciplines of, of learning, I think is important. So even if you were to just print out um, the covers of, of, you know, a cool book on engineering, everything you wanted to know about engineering but were afraid to ask, you know, print that out and go, check out this book, you know, just so that kids are thinking um, beyond just, you know, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory that there's knowledge out there that they can improve their lives. Okay, so, but that's like your call. Okay, Patty's taking my picture. So, <laughs> I know I have broccoli I'm in my teeth. It to our board okay. So they, they can 
know that we're real people. <laughs> okay. <laughs> hey, Patty. Got it? Okay. All right. So I think we've Thanks. talked about that. All right. Um, there's nothing. Okay. Developing reading mentors both in the classroom and at home. Okay. Again, back to more is caught than taught. So I can't emphasize enough that when the modeling is happening um, at home with parents or a caregiver or in the classroom, there's that reading connection um, that's happening with someone who is passionate about reading, getting reading buddies, older kids coming in, of course, that's, you know, often, you know, what happens, but uh, more is always caught than taught. Learning by example, the passionate readers begins with passionate teacher, generally loves the care of students. Identify strong student readers who can partner with struggling readers. Sharing favorite books and friendship. Encourage parents to read with their children, make it a fun shared experience. So you guys do a lot of that, I'm sure already in the classroom, but just again, keeping the passion alive, keeping it fun, uh, making it a shared experience for all involved. I always think I didn't learn anything until I taught it. So I think that's, that's true. So when you are involved in helping another grow, you actually get the benefit too. Um, and kids do as well. All right, so why, okay. All right. How creative writing can build reading passion for a reluctant reader. Okay. Make classroom mailboxes. Encourage students to send silly fun stories, mad libs to each other. Every student gets an anonymous pin pal that is an animal. Students write their silly stories from the animal's perspective using first person, um, a mad lib structure where the students fill in the words. Okay, so if students don't, you guys use mad libs in the classroom? Some, you know about those mad libs? <laughs> They're fun, but it's a way of getting them to think outside of the book and I think the idea that they can write silly stories to each other being a certain kind of animal you know Andy the aardvark you know uh, George the giraffe or something um, that that just makes the reading fun when they realize that they can be silly and have fun um, Dear Duck, I'm George the Giraffe whose neck is long because I love eating leaves from all tall trees. Please write me. Create a group classroom story, sit in a circle, start a silly story. Once there was a toothbrush who hated going to a stinky mouse. One day he decided he had had enough of bad breath so he jumped. Figured out. So again, this kind of experience for kids is um, just making it fun, laughing. It just is good. So, you guys have any ideas on doing that kind of thing? Maybe you do that already in the classroom. Some of you guys do this kind of thing? Okay, great. I'm sure you do. Okay. Oh, why is this not working? Oh, here's an example of a Mad Lib. So, you just create your own. You don't have to use theirs, but you just date George, the you know, George the giraffe is sick with uh, um, tummy. Drink more, you know, pond water and take a, uh, I don't know, a seed as needed or whatever giraffe seed. But that's for them to think about, right? Make those connections. How music and poetry can play can help a child nurture a love of reading. Okay. Uh, language is fun. It's full of rhythm, sounds, and it's helping students discover the joy of language by using cool jokes, rhyming, and riddling as a tool to bring out their joyful song. So um, kids love jokes. Kids love rhymes. Um, I wrote something, and this I, I have in my book, The Heroic Historicals. I have this character who's a um, parrot. And he, he would sing silly ditties to these kids. And just I'll give you a background on Willie and Tilly. But they represent the two opposite ends of kids in a classroom. Where Willie cannot stand 
the classroom experience for learning. He's curious and Willie is all about the books and following the rules. So Willie stumbles on a mysterious compass uh, and he never pays attention to Miss Dilly Winkle. He never turns in his research reports because he, he just ends up copying out of the encyclopedia. And so he just doesn't understand that learning is really fun because his sisters remind him because they're so different in personality that any, it is not fun. I mean, that how could it be? Because she's all about you know following the rules and writing the perfect research report and getting the A's. So these two time travelers crash into his world, Admiral Wright and Captain Perry, through this compass that he finds. And so he's in a classroom. He finds the compass that morning. It starts to spin and go out of control. And he looks out the window and he sees the shiny, shiny silver ship coming in. And so he's mesmerized. And so these time travelers arrive and they just turn their world upside down. So it's kind of Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, but with Admiral Wright and Captain Perry. So Captain Perry is this goofy parrot. So he sings this little silly ditty. Um, to teach a lesson, but it's fun. So singing, so he writes, because Tilly has a lot of pride. She thinks she's better than her brother. And a lot of this dynamic between the two are, is really me working out my issues with my twin sister. <laughs> it was good therapy for me. So, um, so here we go. Um, the captain began to beat on the drum, the rhythm of another silly ditty. He began to sing as the admiral tapped his toes and slapped his thigh. Singing one's own praises is easy to do, but far better someone else to sing them of you. It's easy to have pride in our most inner parts. We feel a bitty bit better inside our hearts, but when those notes come out of the mouth, we may learn we don't know what we sing about. Notes which seem true now ring so flat. Shut your ears or cover them up with your hat. A wise one says, esteem yourself not. Don't build a tower to set yourself on top. It's just my teeter, topple, and then where will you be? Not singing your own praises, most definitely, most definitely. So kids love that kind of thing where you do wordplay, the Dr. Susie thing. Um, you just, I think you just can't get enough of that. Um, so, language is, oh wait, I did that, okay. Um, now this is from the book, Monster. Okay, this chart, I'm really not, this is for you, Patty. I had to put something in there. <laughs> anyway, so picks books that are fun, full of rhyming fun. All right, so here's just a few things, but this um, bringing up book monsters has such a good index for the great books of children's literature. I was so impressed with their list because I'm like always on the lookout for great books. So if you don't know about this book, you need to get it. Bringing up book monsters, and she's a PhD, but and her husband's a creative guy, so he put put graphically things together in a really fun way. But this, she has this chart that she came up with about where kids start. They start building sounds and vocabulary, and then they start doing just for fun. You know, jokes, comics, self-reflected books, learning lessons, science and arts type books, fact-based historical activity books, story books. Um, but the goal, the goal is that kids are reading what they read because it's fun and interesting, and they like it. Um, so I just thought this was an interesting little triangle of how it all begins. And so um, other things you can do, play classical music, which, or any kind of music, jazzy, if you're having fun, play classroom language, building games, telephone, whisper a message and pass along to the student next to you, um, hangman, guessing letters to fill in the blanks, charades, apples to apples, build an awesome classroom library, check out great resources list in building, do not include, okay, not included are two of my favorites, right? <laughs> I am partial. All right, so, okay, and this is a, another book that I wrote, The Bully Buster Journal. It's kind of like Wimpy Kid, um, but I think the illustrations are better. <laughs> um, it was done by a really good artist guy, Gary Locke. So, okay. There we go, book pyramid. All right, there you go. So are we good on this one? Gonna keep a screenshot of it or anything. But I can't recommend, I mean, that book is great. Helping to identify the why of reading develop a good reading habit. I think one of the things that we forget, and I think this is what I was trying to say with my um, penguin story about Ivan, is the why of reading is why should I care? Why should I care that I, so let's imagine a world where nobody learned to read, right? Nobody could read the stop sign. 
How would that work? So reading, not reading has consequences. Not reading well has consequences. Versus reading well has consequences. So helping kids understand why they should care. First of all, you have to model why they need to care. And talk about your own journey as a reader. But I think addressing the purpose of reading, the why of reading, is really important. Um, emphasize the why reading is really fun by coming up with a game or a skit where nobody knows how to read. Reading is a skill to be mastered, just like riding a bicycle. Master well, it will bring you great rewards. Idea can be put on poster, hang in the classroom, ask the students what they think about reading. It's a skill to master, just another easy thing to do. So basically, I think kids think that oh, that you know, it's just it's the reading is hard work. It's a skill, just like riding a bicycle, and that it's going to add value to your life by reading. And this is why it values you. You guys might like to cook. Well, if you can't read the recipe, then you're not going to be able to uh, make those brownies or whatever it is that you like. Um, so just fun ways to communicate that. And imagine a world where nobody can read. Tell a story about that. So any other ideas or anything on that? OK. This is here. Using improvisational storytelling to motivate a reluctant reader. Okay, so um, what do I say about that? Okay, um, have students act out a scene from book or their own writing or imagination in the moment. Okay, so I think that on this one that um, I've seen kids love, not saying all of them, but there's a lot of extroverts in the classroom, in a classroom, but having them act out a story or a scene I think it helps them feel the emotion. I think you want to keep the emotion alive in the student um, when they're reading that they they can really create their character. Okay guess what they're acting out right so the students will have to you know engage okay so what scene are you acting out oh I'm pouring water well what's this no you're this it's sort of like the charade thing that they all love. Um, Begin, it's, it's the community of the students who were acting to describe what they were doing. Okay, um, so then they're using language to describe what they're doing. So the more that they can get themselves involved, body-wise, verbal-wise, sound-wise, the better. Um, after that, they write what that scene was and then read it out loud to themselves. Um, so they're... Yeah, so that, that idea is that they're, they're taking something that they're doing and they're having to think about it, write it out, read it, and they're developing their own little story. Um, now this point I really like. This is the how to help children see stories everywhere, including their own. Okay, so... Okay, so... How many of you guys use... Um, emotional pictures in your classroom and ask the students T what's the story what's going on in that can we can we talk about that so uh, there could be a picture of a boy sitting on a pier wearing a very sad defeated look on his face with a fishing pole lying next to him ask your students what the story by this picture is who is this boy did a bully come by and steal his bucket of fish how could he resolve his problem did he lose his father remember when he used to go fishing with him is he remembering that he ditched school to go fishing he'll have to answer for it the next day did he not catch any fish so just it it brings so many questions out just to be able to um, say, okay, story is everywhere. It's observe, think, um, pay attention. Because storytelling is just learning to see well. Learning to observe and be present with that observation and think carefully what that what that could be and make those connections to to the story. Um, story structure is built on a main character who has a problem which is on other important lessons the main character learns. So, so I think one of the things is story, I, I learned this in acting um, class from a pretty good teacher and she says you know, life is full of the banal, ordinary moments, right? But what separates story from just the stream of consciousness, the banal moments, is that 
is going somewhere, that there's some dramatic, there's some tension, there's the you know, hero archetype thing, that um, there's conflict, there's resolution, there's character growth, there's learning. And that's just like if I were just to videotape you guys sitting here, it just it's kind of like boring. But you know, it makes it interesting when I lose my phone and I'm in a panic and I'm running out to figure out, imagining all, would well, someone come to my car? And, you know, my imagination's going, woo hoo 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 you know. Oh no, maybe someone's using my credit cards right now. So, um, but again, it's, it's, it's when the moment gets out of the ordinariness and takes a new level because there's some heightened emotion of some kind. Then we've got story. Then we're like, oh, well, what happened? Did she find her phone? I hope so because then we won't have her, uh, you know. So when, when that's happening, then we've, we're in a story. We're in a story scene, right? Okay, so, and, okay, all right. Ask them to reflect about something that has some emotional connection to lives or even a funny, unexpected thing that happened to them. Happened to them. Maybe they're struggling in math. How did they become successful in overcoming that obstacle? Maybe they're struggling in writing a five-page research paper. How did they overcome that struggle? What were, some, where, what were some important things they learned about themselves, about life through their own struggles? Stories all about character development. The life is a journey unfolding itself. Show them that characters can choose good choices or bad. Yeah, so I just um, want help the kids just know that that the that story is not just about human characters it could be a char you know it could be a story about you know a weathered barn well what how did that barn get weathered and that barn may you could you know give feelings to the barn you know he was once a shiny red barn um, that had all kinds of animals living in him but the owners moved away and he became a neglected barn and his heart was sad and how could he get his dream was to get his shiny red paint back on him so um, but the, the characters aren't just only with people but also with um, Immaterial, immaterial things as well, but it's what you put into them, how you infuse them. Um, and good writers, readers are master observers. They pay attention to the idea they are ruthless at asking questions, being fiercely curious. That I think is probably the best thought here. Uh, good writers and readers are master observers. They pay attention to the details. They are ruthless at asking questions and being fiercely curious. Why? 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 How come? Help me understand. Um, and I think being Sensitive in the moment is good. Characters on this people can also be in it. I'm saying, I'm so happy because I'm saying, okay, giving that toothbrush a problem, like hating going in a sneaky mouth. This is a story I wrote when I was in second grade <laughs> about Charlie the toothbrush. And his big problem was he hated going in the stinky mouth. And I read it in front of the class, and all the kids laughed. That was hilarious. And I guess that was when the story inside of me was born. I don't know. But it just said, uh, wow, this is fun. I can, I can even make a toothbrush a character if I wanted. So anyway, it, you emphasize your sense that there's no one, no one right way to tell or write a story other than keeping a structure of characters who face problems of kind of Yeah, I mean, we just don't want existential drivel, you know, just going nowhere, you know. It's like, no, there's movements, there's res resolution, there's conflict, there's resolution, there's lessons learned that I think helps students really see that in their own lives, you know, no one likes things just not not completed. You know, the circle has to be completed. And so we just don't want to run the video camera on the banal moments of life and call it story. It's not. So you have to have that idea of structure, of characters having problems, overcoming. Thankfully, my problem of losing my phone was overcome. Thanks to me reaching my hand and, and feeling it there. Okay. I love Kate DiCamillo. You guys love Kate DiCamillo. She's like my hero story writer. She gets it. She's got an essay on her website on writing. And she had a graduate student teacher. She tells, the t she tells about the time where she, um, you know, she kind of put off the assignment. Was She had to write like a descriptive, he asked to write a descriptive piece to really practice the scene. So she was at this, uh, saw this woman, you know, who was uh, singing a song and sitting on a bag of dog food out in the parking lot. She was kind of a gypsy lady. But she described her very poignantly, just was very present and observing 
who she was with compassion as a person. And so at the end, um, she turned her essay in and then the teacher, this uh, graduate student teacher said, hey, I, I, I want to read one one of the students, you know, pieces here to you. And so she talks about how her heart swelled up with pride when her uh, name was called. And, but he said, it's not because she's, you know, because she was thinking, oh, writing is just all about getting everything just like, you know, perfectly said. But what he was saying, and no, it's perfectly seeing. Seeing the character, feeling the character. And he said that because she did that, that was why he was calling her out. Not because, you know, she was some great writer, because she really wasn't, but she, at that time, well, she is a great writer, but because she sees and she feels. And I think, for me, when I am reading someone, I feel the character. I can imagine. I can identify. And then I know the writer is doing their job because there's a movement in my heart to connect with something that they um, have said. And so I just, I, I really like that. And she gives a couple of tips here that are worth saying. Um, look at the world around, pay attention to details, open your heart to what you see, listen to people when they talk, everyone has a story, eavesdrop, join in conversations, ask questions, and pay attention when people answer them. And I think that, again, it's all about slowing down and pausing and seeing. I know for me, because I tend to be, you know, quick, that when I take that deep breath and I digest my food, I slow the roll, you know, I, I listen to something that I may be really uncomfortable with, but I can live in that discomfort because maybe there's something I'm supposed to learn. Or I just even look at the movement of the wind on, on the leaves on a tree and the way the light's hitting them, observe that, experience that, and be able to capture that with language is so someone could experience that in a meaningful way. That's the art of writing. And I think helping kids, when you come across a gifted storyteller like Kate DiCamillo, say, oh, this is like amazing. Look at what she's doing here. It's like, wow, did you see that? Like helping kids develop an appetite for seeing what good writing is, what great writing is, or average writing is. Um, and, and just like, they have, to ha they have to see it. They have to someone to educate them. They're just not going to get it on their own necessarily. But someone has to show them. And that's part of what will ignite that passion for reading. I mean, when I look at, you know, some passages from Charles, uh, from Will Dahl and his descriptions of the factory or the, or the, the character who, uh, Veruca Salt, who liked all the bubble gum and just the way he described her, or Mrs. Trunchbull in Matilda, um, I just think, oh, it's just brilliant. He does such a great job. You know, I get excited. Um, and so helping kids see that when another author or writer does something that really is an example of brilliant, great writing, then, then they'll look for that. They'll have an appetite, you know, for, for like filet mignon rather than, you know, McDonald's. So, I don't know, any comments on that? Okay. Um, look at your characters and the people around you with compassion. Yeah. The world is broken and so are people. So in other words, just, I mean, it's one thing, just to watch, watch in your, in writing. no one likes, you know, judgmentalism on others, but just to be able to say, okay, I want to write compassionately. What's their story? You know, that homeless person, you know, oh, they just need to get a job. Oh, stop your silly judgments. You don't know their story. Maybe... They had a really tough time of it. You don't know their story, but look at them with compassion, with heart, um, and help your kids develop that too. And to understand the characters and their uniqueness as a good writer. And Kate DeCamille has just amazing uh, ability to do that. And um, I, I've learned a lot from her, um, but in my Bully Buster book here, um, I created some characters, and um, I have this uh, aunt, Aunt Gertie, um, 
and this is Boy's journey to bust the worst bully in the universe, Tommy Muggersnot, and he tries everything he can to bust him, but nothing works until a long lost uncle appears, who he thinks is, um, you know, a space invader, because he's invading his space. He's going to have to share the bunk room with he's a single his mom is a single mom and she works two and a half jobs and so he doesn't want the space invader in his room you know taking up his space um, so he just thinks he's this archaeologist research mole guy but he's actually an Indiana Jones really cool dude so he tells him the secret of bully busting but when I was writing this I had a lot of fun really feeling my characters especially Aunt Gertie and and as I wrote her, I tried to think about her as a person, her brokenness. And I show a lot of her vulnerabilities. And it's just so fun when you're in that space and you're actually feeling your characters. And you, they're like companions and friends because you're like getting into their story. And I think helping kids catch that in their own reading experience that, you know, see these characters that are being talked about by, by writers, what, what is going on there? Um, and why do I like this or resonate with this? Okay. Uh, make sure that reading this is a shared experience. Okay, this is it. I pretty much wrapped it up here. Um, so these are some of the research references that I would recommend that you check out. There's a great list of books, Honey for a Child's Heart, Bring It Book Monsters, The Educated Imagination is more, Patty probably liked that one as a scholarly book. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, I think you're too hard on yourself, Patty. You're very fun and practical. You're a teacher. Well, you're practical, but you, you have a way. You have a heart. Patty has a huge heart. I love that about Patty. And Mortimer Adler, How to Read a Book, which is helping kids understand worldview, where the author is coming from. That's an old classic. Um, these are like, oh, goodbye. Um, so, yeah, so that's um, what you want is just to help kids just think about reading as an adventure. It's fun and um, it'll change their life when they, you know, when they catch it. It's like just caught than taught, but yet you still have to teach because it's a skill, but you're catching the reading fever. You're going to turn your child, your student, into someone who truly loves books and, and just reading. Um, yeah, so this is me. So you can get in touch with me at AnnieAnnieWinson.com. And thank you for listening to me. I took too long, but I'm glad that we could have this time to share. So any questions, comments? I agree, I don't agree. Are we good? Good. Yeah, thank you. Good. Thank you.